Looking over the MCU's blockbuster history, it's pretty clear that the franchise has a villain problem, but despite that, we've actually seen some fairly compelling criminals cause trouble for our heroes. Here are all the villains in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, ranked from worst to best. In the Dark World, Curse leads a prison riot, helps Malekith sack Asgard, and kills Thor's mother, Frigga. He also leads the battle against Thor in the film's climax, beating the Thunder God senseless with his brute strength. But even with all that, Curse is little more than a forgettable monster with no personality. Fenris, Hela's enormous wolf, is an undead beast who tries to finish off the Asgardian refugees toward the end of Thor Ragnarok. To the wolf's credit, the menacing green-eyed monster definitely looks cool, but sadly, Fenris really doesn't do much. After Hela animates her beloved familiar, he just sort of hangs out and looks mean while the Death Goddess interrogates a crowd of scared Asgardians. In the final battle, Fenris tries and fails to kill the Hulk. On the one hand, it's nice to see another bad guy from Thor's rogues gallery fit into the film. On the other hand, it seems like the only reason Fenris is included is because the Hulk needed something to tussle with during the climactic final battle. Laufey is a powerful force in Thor's corner of the MCU, but we never really see much of him in action. King of the Frost Giants is the biological father of Loki. He has super strength and ice powers, but he's still no match for the sneakiness of his own son. Loki manipulates events to get Laufey to attack Asgard and Thor, but just as Laufey is about to kill Odin, Loki takes out Laufey instead, killing the Frost Giant King and making himself look like a hero in an unceremonious end. Aldrich Killian turned out to be the A-list bad guy in Iron Man 3, with Brant and Savin shaping up as little more than B-list versions with the same powers. Both are given their superheating and healing powers by the Extremis virus, and they both attack Tony Stark throughout the film, but neither is a match for Iron Man, even when he doesn't have a suit. Scorpion is a pretty big deal in the comics, but in Spider-Man Homecoming, not so much. His most notable actions are complete failures. First, when an arms deal is interrupted by Spider-Man, and then later when he tries to get the Sinister Six going in prison before being shut down by the Vulture. Basically, he's just there to make Adrian Toomes look cooler by comparison. And when you're not as cool as the Vulture, it's safe to say you screwed up pretty bad somewhere along the way. It's easy to forget, but yes, Batroc the Leaper is part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We meet the French mercenary during the opening ship hijacking sequence in The Winter Soldier. We get a breathless fight scene between Captain America and Batroc, with Cap accepting Batroc's challenge for a hand-to-hand -hand fight without a shield. Batroc holds his own, though Cap eventually knocks him out. But hey, at least he's a little cooler than this version. Spider-Man Homecoming gave us not just one, but two Shockers. We meet the first Shocker, Jackson Bryce, as he's wielding a Shocker gauntlet. But after the Vulture kills him, the weapons pass to Herman Schultz. Schultz looks to be our main Shocker in the MCU, and he gets one epic fight against Spidey before being sidelined. Shocker jumps Peter as he leaves the school dance, attempting to follow the Vulture. The villain sends Spidey flying through a school bus, knocking his web shooters off in the process. So why does Shocker rank so low? Because it wasn't even Spidey who took him out. It was Pete's pal Ned who grabs a web shooter and hits Shocker, distracting him long enough for Spidey to web into a school bus. Baron Von Strucker led the experiments on Loki's scepter that created Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch, so he's definitely important. But all anyone really remembers about him is his immediate surrender to the Avengers during the opening of Age of Ultron. No surrender! No surrender! I'm going to surrender. In the end, Strucker was just another Hydra goon, cut off his head and nobody really noticed. When the Destroyer shows up in Thor, it makes full use of every moment. The Destroyer's giant, powerful arms and legs can crush or stomp just about any opponent, and if they don't kill you, its laser blast probably will. We saw the Destroyer kill a few Frost Giants, then lay waste to a small town in New Mexico when Loki sent it to Earth hunting Thor. Still, it was no match for Thor when the God of Thunder regained his power and overcharged the Destroyer, ending the attack. Credit Sam Rockwell's unending charisma for Iron Man 2's Justin Hammer not showing up at the very bottom of this list. As far as credible villains are concerned, Justin Hammer is an absolute joke. He runs an arms manufacturer that's a rival to Stark Industries, except everything Hammer builds falls apart. The first version of the War Machine armor is basically a bare-bones Iron Man suit outfitted with a ton of hammer weapons, which works just about as well as duct tape and accessories to a car. To summarize, Sam Rockwell is great. Justin Hammer still kind of sucks, though. Dr. Samuel Stearns doesn't actually ever call himself the leader, which is his villainous identity in the comics, but the Incredible Hulk isn't exactly subtle about the eccentric scientist's destiny. The last we see of him, he's on the ground as the Hulkified blood he's just pumped into Emil Blonsky drips into an open wound on his head. If a Hulk sequel had come to pass, we would almost certainly have seen Tim Blake Nelson return as the psychic and super-intelligent leader. Nelson is perfect as an obsessed scientist who doesn't care much about the consequences of pursuing his goals across ethical lines. 
While he never actually turns green on screen, he shows plenty of signs of a moral compass in need of some fine-tuning. He clones a whole room full of Banner's blood without Banner's knowledge or consent, and he has no problem with the notion of turning Blonsky into abomination. And of course, in his final moments in the movie, he's seen smiling when any sane person would be horrified. In The Incredible Hulk, General Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross spends the entire film trying and failing to kill Bruce Banner. And for much of the film, he's a relatively one-dimensional military bad guy. Interestingly, however, Ross is one of the few characters from The Incredible Hulk to resurface later in the MCU. He became the U.S. Secretary of State in Captain America Civil War, pushing for the adoption of the Sokovia Accords, and even made cameos in Infinity War and Endgame, setting him up for even badder bad guy stuff in films to come. In an effort to capture the Hulk, humiliated soldier Emil Blonsky hits himself with an experimental version of the same gamma stuff that makes Hulks and Hulks, except it doesn't turn him into another Hulk. Instead, he becomes the Abomination, a monstrous one-note creature that looks like a rotting troll. Yawn. He lives through the end of The Incredible Hulk and is apparently in a jail cell somewhere. Dark Elf Malekith had almost no personality and basically existed as a freaky-looking dude trying to get an Infinity Stone, and Thanos already does that way, way better. It's a shame, because on the surface, Malekith is extremely formidable. He even stages a surprise assault on Asgard itself, breaching the city's defenses, and later sets his sights on Earth. He put up a heck of a fight against Thor in the final act of the Dark World, though the God of Thunder still prevails. Mickey Rourke's whiplash was one of the many problems in Iron Man 2, despite some admittedly awesome action scenes along the way. Whiplash never feels all that intimidating, at least after that epic attack at the Monaco Grand Prix. He's motivated by a vague, kind of boring backstory and teams up with Justin Hammer, who we've already established kind of sucks. And then there was that odd obsession with his bird. Tanelier Tavon, better known as The Collector, has a remarkably low-key career as an MCU villain. You might understandably question whether he's really a villain at all. Look carefully and you can see that he's pretty darn evil. As early as his first appearance in a Thor The Dark World mid credit scene, we learn that one of his goals is to collect all of the Infinity Stones, but probably just for bragging rights, not conquering the universe. But a closer look at his expansive collection reveals a whole lot of unwilling prisoners. We're fairly certain that if the Collector were ever given a more active role in the MCU, he'd earn a higher spot on this list. There's something intriguing about the way he's been on the periphery of the narrative's most cataclysmic events. Mystery surrounds Tavon, including the mystery of whether or not he's still alive. When Obadiah Stane decides to take out Tony Stark while Stark's on an overseas tour in the first Iron Man film, he contacts the terrorist organization The Ten Rings, led by Raza to make it happen. Raza keeps Stark captive and proves an intimidating villain, at least until Stark builds his first version of the Iron Man suit and makes short work of Raza's soldiers. Raza was savvy enough to survive, and he tracked down stray bits of Stark's armor and tried to cut another deal with Stane. The problem? Stane was more savvy than Raza and used a sonic taser to paralyze him and kill his men. Despite his unceremonious ending, Raza is still technically the first villain we met in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and a throwback to the simple days of the MCU. Korath has a small but memorable role in Guardians of the Galaxy, which provided one of the most memorable moments from the movie's opening scenes. Hey, you know what? There's another name you might know me by. Star-Lord. Who? Star-Lord, man. Though Star-Lord gets the better of him, Korath still puts up a heck of a fight. He also manages to reacquire the Infinity Stone along with Nebula, which sets up Ronan the Accuser's near-world-ending attack on Xandar. Without Korath, Ronan would never have had the Infinity Stone to begin with, so he certainly served a purpose. He even holds his own against Drax the Destroyer for a while, at least until Drax rips out the cybernetic implant in his head, killing him. Hey, at least he went out fighting. Andy Serkis actually does an extremely entertaining job with Ulysses' claw in both Age of Ultron as well as Black Panther, which gives us a believable version of the claw we know from the comics and cartoons, a character who still has the potential to come back after his death as a dude made of sound waves. Hopefully, the MCU will resurrect this classic comics B-lister for future supervillainous action. Walter Goggins is a genuine delight every time he shows up on screen, and his appearance in Ant-Man and the Wasp is no exception. Sure, Sonny Birch doesn't do much compared to the likes of Killmonger or Thanos, but he might be one of the MCU's most comic booky villains ever. As a dealer in illicit technology, Birch is a character that, like the Vulture, operates on the fringes of a universe filled with magic hammers and alien technology. The difference is, Birch is the kind of sleazy mastermind who rolls around in a white and gold SUV, conducts his illegal business in broad daylight, and commands an army of nameless motorcycle-riding henchmen. Birch is the perfect character to have around to reinforce the idea that there's more to this world than Shakespearean gods and magic space rocks. 
She might not have been the big bad in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, but the golden goddess Aisha was able to cause more than enough trouble for Star-Lord and his team. The leader of the powerful Sovereign, she commands a fleet of remote-controlled warships that come within one shot of taking out the Milano following an extensive chase. Moreover, the post credit scene revealed Aisha seems to be responsible for creating Adam Warlock, a major player in Marvel's cosmic universe and someone we expect to meet in Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3. If nothing else, that makes her more than worthy of a slot on this list. The Chitauri basically served as cannon fodder against Earth's mightiest heroes in the final hour of the Avengers. Even still, they are a massive alien army, led by those positively terrifying gigantic dragon ships that tore through Manhattan. Their eventual humiliation notwithstanding, the Chitauri were more than formidable enough to push the Avengers to the brink in their first big-screen team-up. And when they returned for their big final battle in Endgame, their only strength seems to be in numbers, and they were defeated just as easily. In Captain America The First Avenger, Arnim Zola's appearance is basically just an easter egg. In Winter Soldier, however, the setup of having Zola around for the first movie pays off in a cool way. He might not be a robot with a camera for a head and his face on a giant TV screen built into his guts like in the comics, but what Winter Soldier's big reveal lacks in robot bodies, it more than makes up for by making him genuinely creepy. Anyone familiar with Marvel Comics knew some kind of villainous turn was coming for Mordo and Doctor Strange. While he spends most of the film as Strange's ally, the angry sorcerer abandons his allies after Strange makes his bargain with Dormammu. After the credits, we see Mordo become the nemesis he's long been in the comics, declaring there are too many sorcerers in the world. He's bound to be a challenging antagonist in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Plus, he's played by Chiwetela Geofor. The Oscar-nominated actor is not only a superb performer, but he's particularly great in villainous roles. The Black Order are perfectly serviceable henchmen for Infinity War. They manage to hit that sweet spot of being threatening enough to present the heroes with a challenge, but they also provide additional room for the action so that it's not just 40 people trying to punch Thanos at the same time. Ultimately, they're not so threatening that they overshadow the actual villain of the piece. Each of them is distinct and visually menacing, especially Ebony Maw. Unfortunately, most of them don't actually get to do much other than lose, so that's a bit of a drawback. In Guardians of the Galaxy, Ronan was a religious zealot who co-opted the Power Stone to continue his crusade to wipe out Xandar. But even without one of those awesomely powerful baubles, he's still a heck of a warrior. After all, he laid waste to Drax the Destroyer without even breaking a sweat. He also had the guts to stick it to Thanos, and actually walked away from the Mad Titan without much consequence. The Guardians were no match for Ronin individually, but luckily Star-Lord was able to actually control the Infinity Stone with the help of his team, his half-celestial powers, and some sweet dance moves. All of those things together, and Star-Lord was able to blast the bad guy into oblivion. Ant-Man's Darren Cross spent his entire career trying to duplicate Hank Pym's shrinking formula, but when he did it and created the Yellow Jacket combat suit, he didn't realize his copycat formula was actually messing with his brain, making him dangerously unstable. That led to a villain who was not only dangerously unhinged, but got some really cool fight scenes, the best of which was on a child's play table. Ant-Man and the Wasp's super-powered villain Ghost has a lot going for her. Visually, her flickering and phasing through objects is some of the coolest-looking stuff we've seen in the MCU. It's even better in the fight scenes. The shrinking and growing stuff is fun, but pitting that stuff against a completely different set of powers makes for some pretty compelling action. Since she seemingly reforms at the end of the film, we're obviously meant to like her. She has a sympathetic backstory as a victim of Hank Pym's egotistical past, but at the same time, we're also supposed to like Hank, so his part in Ghost's backstory still involves him ultimately being right. None of this is too surprising. Marvel is full of bad guys doing the wrong thing for the right reasons, but it does feel pretty clear that Ghost was shoehorned into Ant-Man and the Wasp, rather than building her more organically. Still, the effects are great, and Hannah John Common's performance captures Ava's understandable bitterness and desperation effectively. Diehard comics fans know Surtur is a major villain in Thor's world. In Thor Ragnarok, however, he appears only in the opening act and destructive finale. That's not to say he's not important to the story. In Norse mythology, the word Ragnarok points to the apocalyptic battle between gods that results in a world destroyed by fire. While Surtur is indeed the monster all Asgardians fear, Thor and Loki summon him to invoke the Ragnarok prophecy. This defeats Hela, but at a price. His attack decimates Asgard, crumbling the city and the sky to dust. When Marvel asked Annette Bening to play a villain in Captain Marvel, they probably didn't open with, you're going to be a giant, green, disembodied head with a bunch of gross tendrils floating in some kind of goo. That would be an accurate description of the character's physical appearance in the comics. But instead of the bulbous, floating head, Captain Marvel's creative directors chose to represent the AI that rules the Kree Empire as a kind of psychic projection. 
Everyone who communes with the supreme intelligence sees someone different, and in Carol's case, the intelligence appears as her mentor, Marvell. As viewers, we spend a lot of time in Captain Marvel thinking the Skrulls are the bad guys. Once the truth is revealed, it's Yon Rog who's the most visible villain. Perhaps in the future, we'll see more of the Kree ruler, giving the Supreme Intelligence a chance to get a better spot on this list. Red Skull easily stands out as one of the most original and terrifying baddies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In the first Avenger, he commands his own Hydra-branded Nazi division, complete with Tesseract-powered weapons, and has his own version of the Super Soldier Serum, making him Cap's physical equal. He vanished while trying to harness the power of the Tesseract Space Stone, but his surprise return as the Guardian of the Soul Stone in Infinity War only served to remind us how great he was so many years ago. He might have just been a disciple of Dormammu, but Cassilius was plenty intimidating in his own right. A highly trained sorcerer who went rogue, left the Ancient One's order to try and take out the Masters of the Mystic Arts, and nearly succeeded. In Doctor Strange, Cassilius manages to destroy two sanctums, put the Ancient One's forces on the robes, and shows his prowess with magic and a few excellent fight sequences. Luckily, a quick-thinking Strange manages to turn the tables and win the day. The Tinkerer is exactly the kind of character that the MCU needed, for the same reason that he was exactly the kind of character that the comics needed, someone who builds all the gadgets the bad guys use to fight the good guys. He's certainly not the focus of Spider-Man Homecoming, but Phineas Mason is the kind of quiet bad guy who makes the MCU feel just a bit more real. Every great ruler needs someone beside them to carry their melting stick. In Thor Ragnarok, that job goes to Topaz, the sadistic and unforgiving right-hand woman to the Grandmaster, and she's a perfect match for her eccentric boss. While he delights in his games and acquisitions, Topaz stands nearby ready with his instruments of torture, always eager for the Grandmaster to melt people. Unfortunately for the Grandmaster, Topaz does not survive Ragnarok and crashes while chasing Bruce Banner, Thor, and Valkyrie during their escape from Sakaar. Topaz's service to Grandmaster is clearly not forgotten. In one of Marvel's shorts, we see that the Grandmaster has built a modest shrine to his former assistant in his new Los Angeles apartment. Of all the impressive things about Spider-Man Homecoming, one of the most notable is just how many characters the film pulled in from the comics. And the best minor villain appearance by far is absolutely Aaron Davis, known in the comics as the Prowler. In the film, he's hilariously and thoroughly unimpressed by Peter Parker's enhanced interrogation. What happened to your voice? What do you mean, what happened to my voice? I heard you by the bridge. I know what a girl sound like. I'm not a girl. I'm a boy. I mean, I'm a, I'm a man. I don't care what she are. It's one of the best comedic scenes in the entire MCU, but what really makes it special is Davis's mention of his nephew. As comic readers know, Davis's nephew is Miles Morales, who eventually takes the name of Spider-Man. As far as villainy goes, Davis doesn't accomplish much beyond a failed arms deal. Hinting at a future of the MCU that includes Miles, though? That's awesome. Sure, the Ravagers aren't all villains. At the end of Guardians of the Galaxy, plenty of them sacrifice themselves to save Xandar. But in the sequel, we see a darker side of these mercenaries. When Taserface takes over Yondu's Ravagers, everyone still loyal to Yondu is rewarded by being injected into space as their former comrades laugh and wave. Most of them are also more than happy to abuse poor baby Groot. And of all the survivors, only Kraglin refrains from trying to kill Yondu, Rocket, and Groot as they escape. As villains, the Ravagers don't accomplish a lot, and without someone like Yondu or Nebula supporting them, they don't provide much of a challenge to the heroes. But while they may be cannon fodder, they still give us a lot of laughs. Their well-deserved beatings provide some of the most fun sequences in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Brock Rumlow started out as a member of Captain America's strike team in Winter Soldier, eventually revealing himself as a Hydra agent when the attempted takeover began. He managed to survive and resurfaced during the opening fights in Civil War, where he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with both Cap and Black Widow before blowing himself up in the event that ended up driving the Avengers apart. For a villain, that's a pretty good way to go. Dormammu is one of the biggest villains in Marvel Comics, and surprisingly, the MCU actually kept the extremely powerful ruler of the Dark Dimension relatively close to his comics counterpart. Doctor Strange's trip to the Dark Dimension was practically a Steve Ditko panel brought to life. Dormammu is so powerful that Doctor Strange had no chance of hurting him, so he had to outsmart him to save the world, trapping the villain in a time loop where Dormammu killed him over and over, until he was forced to bargain for his freedom. It makes for one of the most clever finales in all of the MCU, and lands Dormammu high on our list of favorites. After one final explosive tussle with Gamora, Nebula joins the side of the Angels in Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2, but that's not true of every version of Nebula we meet. In fact, it's indirectly because of Nebula that Thanos gets to wage his final battle against the good guys in Endgame. When Nebula goes back in time to 2014 to help get the orb, the Nebula of that time becomes aware of her. The 2014 Nebula isn't reformed. She's still loyally killing anything and everything her father tells her to, as well as harboring murderous jealousy towards Gamora. 
2014 Nebula is pretty tragic. Even when she's confronted by her heroic future self, the 2014 Nebula sees no way out. She clearly wants to be different, but she ultimately dies because of her refusal to change, even though the proof that she can change is literally standing in front of her. When Marvel signed Robert Redford for a superhero movie, you knew it'd be an interesting role, and his turn as Alexander Pierce delivered. He's introduced as the well-meaning Secretary of the World Security Council, an old friend of Nick Fury, though it's eventually revealed Pierce is actually a Hydra agent leading their infiltration of S.H.I.E.L.D. Pierce shepherded the program designed to create the network telecarrier system everyone is fighting over in the Winter Soldier. He also planted bombs and the name tags of the other Security Council members, which he uses to brutally murder them when they challenge his takeover. He stayed evil to the end, too, uttering Hail Hydra with his dying breath after Nick Fury put two rounds into his chest. Now that's a villain. Hail Hydra. Ben Kingsley's character in Iron Man 3 wasn't actually the real Mandarin, and the All Hail the King one-shot short suggested the actual bad guy could still be out there, waiting to make his move. But that fake Mandarin still gave us the chills, at least until it was revealed that he's really just an out-of-work actor named Trevor Slattery, who can barely be trusted with a six-pack of beer, much less a gun. Still, though it loses some luster by the end, the Mandarin presented in the front half of Iron Man 3 is one of the scariest baddies in the MCU. It might have been a ruse, but it was effective. And you'll never see me coming. <laughs> When Thor is suddenly marooned on the junk planet Sakaar, he comes in contact with the Grandmaster. In the comics, the Grandmaster is just an immortal dude who loves playing games of any kind. But in the hands of Jeff Goldblum, the Grandmaster becomes one of the weirdest and funniest characters in the MCU. Here's hoping we get to see a lot more of him in the future. Oh, well, maybe not as much as he wants us to. On any other world, I'd be like uh, millions of years old. But here on Sakaar... You have to respect where it all began, and Jeff Bridges' Obadiah Stane, aka Ironmonger, set the tone for the villains of the MCU in the first Iron Man film. Bridges Stane is positively slimy, betraying Tony Stark and inadvertently setting his entire hero's journey in action. So really, we can thank Stane for kicking off the entire MCU. When his assassination attempt on Stark in the desert fails, Stane eventually dons the massive Ironmonger suit to try and finish the job himself. A lot has changed since Iron Monger stalked the skies, but his final fight with Iron Man had a brutal, messy feel that really let you feel the hate Stane had for Stark, and it still resonates, even in a world with heavy hitters like Thanos prowling around. James Spader's chilling voice brought absolute terror to the metal menace that was Ultron, with a near-endless supply of robot bodies and a design that had comic fans geeking out. He exemplifies how technology can be our greatest scourge, though Ultron does it with a wit that only Spader can provide, verbally sparring with the best of them. Like any great villain, Ultron also has a real motivation for his dastardly deeds. Looking at the facts, Ultron's final determination that humans and superheroes are what make the world such a dangerous place makes its own twisted kind of sense. The most amazing thing about Helmut Zemo in Civil War is that he's just an average guy with no real plans for world domination. He's just a man who wants revenge for the death of his family, and he's wise enough to realize the best way to take out the Avengers is to set them against one another. Yes, his plan does require a few big leaps of movie logic, but it was refreshing to see a villain like Zemo brought to life in the MCU. He's a great reminder that it doesn't take world-smashing superpowers to give Earth's mightiest heroes a run for their money. Iron Man 3 is one of the most polarizing movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, featuring an epic fake-out that reveals Guy Pearce's Aldrich Killian is actually the villain behind a mysterious rash of bombings and terrorist attacks sweeping the globe. His secret weapon? Extremis, a versatile technology that first showed up in the Iron Man comics and is reimagined here as a way to superheat one's body and literally regrow limbs. Killian's particular skill set makes for one of the most technically ambitious fight scenes in the MCU. It's sometimes hard to believe any villain can truly go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Tony Stark, but Killian made a heck of a run. Peter Quill's search for his father was a key part of Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2, a journey that brought him face-to-face -face with Kurt Russell's Ego, who's as bad a dad as they come. Ego is one of the most powerful villains in the MCU, right up there alongside Thanos himself. Ego is essentially a god who wants to literally become the universe by replacing all other life. And Russell sells it so well that you really understand where Ego's coming from. Even if he's a psychopath who's killed hundreds of his own children in his quest for power, Ego redefined the concept of daddy issues. Of course I have issues! <laughs> That's my freaking father! Mysterio isn't the best villain in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but he might just be the cleverest. 
After 10 years of movies inspired by comics, the MCU proved with Endgame that it was its own distinct version of the superhero universe. A series of alternate surprises led to Mysterio, with a promise of a multiverse that could take things to the next level. And then we find out that it's all just one big con. Instead of being the way forward, Mysterio ties everything back to the very first Iron Man movie, and is one of the many things that made Far From Home the perfect epilogue to the Infinity Saga. In a universe of world-destroying monsters, the Vulture is decidedly street-level in his approach, but that's exactly what makes him work. The film's writers tweaked his backstory to make Adrian Toomes the father of Peter Parker's teenage crush in Spider-Man Homecoming, and he takes the girlfriend's angry dad trope to a whole new level. The effects team did an amazing job with his armor and appearance, with the Vulture looking positively terrifying and inhuman when he's stalking his prey. We've never seen Thor face a villain like Hela, the goddess of death, in any of the other MCU films. Much like Loki before her, this Asgardian villain is someone audiences will immediately love to hate. As soon as Odin passes away, Hela appears to the brothers and presents her plan to take her rightful place on Asgard's throne. To prove her point, she easily crushes Thor's hammer. The truth is eventually revealed that Hela once acted as Odin's executioner, leading the Asgardian army to victory over all nine realms. This secret history elevates Hela to epic villain status. Eric Killmonger essentially has a superhero's origin. His father is killed in front of him, his royal heritage is denied to him, and he uses those tragedies to motivate a relentless dedication, training himself to the peak of his abilities before seeking vengeance. That setup is a whole lot closer to Batman than it is to Ultron. When you add in the fact that Killmonger specifically wants to address a continuing history of racism, it's hard not to admit that he makes some pretty good points. Even if he's right, though, his goal is dominance rather than leadership, which makes him a true ideological opponent for T'Challa. It's one of the things that makes their final battle, in which they're both in nearly identical Black Panther costumes, so good. They're reflections of each other, both committed to fight for their ideals without compromising who they are. There's a reason Marvel Studios chose to use Loki as an ongoing villain for the Avengers. He's one of the most compelling, calculated, and charismatic villains ever. Tom Hiddleston is so good at being bad that Marvel opted to keep him around long after his bid for supremacy was foiled at the hands of Earth's mightiest heroes. He's still no match for the Hulk. But who is? Oh, wait, we know who. Thanos is the villain of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There's been a lot of character work put into the cinematic version of Thanos, which is especially impressive considering that most of it is shown to the audience in Infinity War, a movie that's also juggling story arcs for dozens of other characters at the same time. Through it all, he's shown to have the same quality that all the greatest villains share. He thinks he's right. He's the hero of his own story, the only one who can step up and save the universe from itself, and is willing to sacrifice whatever he needs to in pursuit of that goal. In the comics, Thanos has been referred to as the ultimate nihilist, but the MCU's version is the exact opposite. He believes very much in what he's doing, which makes him even more compelling and more dangerous. Once you've had a villain who can kill half the universe with a snap of his fingers, what chance does any other villain have of being that scary or threatening? Let's take a look at some villains from Marvel Comics who can give Thanos a run for his money when it comes to being frightening. Galactus isn't necessarily evil, but he's definitely terrifying. He's an unstoppable force of nature, and while he doesn't actually want to hurt any of the trillions of people whose lives he's ended over the years, that's not because he has any affection for them. It's because he just doesn't care about them at all. When the great hunger is upon me, all creatures are enemies! Galactus first arrived in Fantastic Four No. 48 by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, kicking off decades of his status as the definitive cosmic threat in Marvel Comics. He's a survivor of the universe before ours, reborn in the Big Bang as the Devourer of Worlds, a creature seemingly beyond morality who is driven by his endless hunger to eat entire planets. While he's been defeated every time he's come to Earth in the past, including once when he was confronted with the souls of every living creature he'd devoured in his billion-year life, his very existence is downright Lovecraftian. For all its colorful superheroes, the Marvel Universe also features a galactic force to whom all of humanity is completely insignificant, and who might show up to end life on Earth whenever he gets peckish. When Annihilus was first introduced in the pages of Fantastic Four, he was called the Living Death That Walks, and in the years since, He's more than lived up to that title. Thanos might have killed half the universe, and Galactus might devour planets, but they at least see what they're doing as necessary. Annihilus, on the other hand, doesn't just pillage his way across the galaxy, he enjoys every second of it. At heart, Annihilus is an insect, and as the ruler of the chaotic interdimensional negative zone, 
He's got an entire swarm of space locusts at his command ready to consume everything in their path. That's exactly what happened in Marvel's Annihilation crossover, where he led an insectoid armada to destroy entire planets. He's incapable of pity or remorse, and would casually snuff out billions of lives just to expand his empire. The Marvel Universe is full of unsettling monstrosities, and compared to them, an overgrown octopus with a gigantic eye might not seem that scary. The thing is, that's not really Shumagorath. It's just the way it appears in the physical world. In reality, well, it's reality anyway, it's part of an extra-dimensional race of beings known as the Many-Angled Ones who ruled Earth as gods during prehistory. It was cast down by Krom, the uncaring warrior god worshipped by Conan the Barbarian, but it's been trying to find its way back to Earth ever since. I will come for your dimension next! As Marvel's attempt to bring some HP Lovecraft-style horror to the comics page, Shumagorath was terrifying from its very first appearance, when it forced Doctor Strange to kill his own teacher in order to stop the evil possessing him from within. There have been evil gods in the Marvel Universe for as long as Loki's been around, but Shumagorath was the first one to be inhuman and incomprehensible, which makes it way scarier. As a creature who exists entirely on the astral plane, in the realm of thoughts, the Shadow King has no body of his own. He can, however, take over anyone else's body and consume their personality. When that happens, we're not just talking about the kind of mind control that's common in superhero stories. The Shadow King wants to experience the physical world however he can, spending years in a body, using it to live out his every hedonistic desire and ruining the body in the process. One of the most horrifying examples of his parasitic use of his host comes in the pages of New Mutants, when he took over Karma and twisted her body into something monstrous from an indulgence in carnal pleasures. More recently, he's been used as the primary villain on the TV series Legion, which depicts him as the chameleon-like creature of corruption that he's always been in the comics. Kilgrave, also known as the Purple Man, isn't a god or a cosmic entity or a non-corporeal psychic being. He's just a man with one of the most simple superpowers imaginable. He can make anyone do anything he wants. His slightest suggestion is an irresistible command. If he tells someone to stop breathing, they'll suffocate without drawing another breath. He can't even turn his power on and off. When he was first created, he was just another mind-controlling supervillain, but over the years, his ability to effortlessly control everyone around him twisted his mind into something truly horrifying. When he was brought back to comics as part of Jessica Jones' backstory, his true terrifying potential was on display with his ability to rob victims of their own will and autonomy, combined with the very real-world horror of sexual assault. Comics creators borrow ideas from other pieces of pop culture all the time, and The Brood might be one of the best examples. Created in the pages of Uncanny X-Men in 1982, they're pretty much just the Marvel Universe equivalent of the creature from Ridley Scott's 1979 film Alien. In the interest of doing something slightly different from that film, though, Chris Claremont and Dave Cockrum created an even more viscerally frightening body horror concept. While the xenomorph from Alien implants an egg that bursts out of a human body and kills the host, the brood reproduce in another way. Their eggs don't burst out, they take over their victims' bodies and transform them into new brood. The host is still trapped in there while their new form uses their memories and knowledge to more effectively conquer the galaxy. In other words, the Brood are the answer to the question, what if Xenomorphs were also zombies and also trapped you in a mutated body that you couldn't control? Fear comes in many shapes, and these guys are at least three of them. We've seen countless King villains. Some are utterly horrifying, and others are completely laughable. But there's a handful that are so terrifying they'll inspire nightmares. These are the Stephen King movie villains who've kept us up at night, ranked from worst to the very best. The Shawshank Redemption demonstrates how some of the scariest movie monsters are the ones you could meet in real life. Warden Samuel Norton is a man who's willing to do whatever it takes to gain power over others. Don't you ever mention money to me again. He claims to be a man of God, but he runs Shawshank State Prison like a slave owner, manipulating inmates to do his bidding and punishing anyone who doesn't comply. Ultimately, Norton is a coward. He chooses to take the easy way out when confronted with his own misdeeds. But cowards like Norton are capable of doing some truly frightening and despicable things, and they shouldn't be underestimated. 
We can't say for certain whether Stephen King has something against organized religion, but religious figures are often the villains in his story. Take Reverend Lowe, for example, a man of the cloth with a beastly secret. 1985's Silver Bullet tells the story of a small town terrorized by a werewolf and the people who are brave enough to fight the ungodly creature. The film is indicative of a lot of horror films that came out in the 1980s. It's more cheesy than actually scary. Honestly, the fact that Gary Busey is one of the stars tells you everything you need to know. Still, werewolves are scary beasts, and the fact that this werewolf is the town's religious leader makes him all the more frightening. There's nothing scarier than an evil child, and the town in Children of the Corn is full of them. Some might argue that the scariest presence in the film is he who walks behind the rows. That's the fertility demon who dwells in the cornfield, and these nasty kids keep sacrificing the town's adults in order to appease him. Of course, demons are bad news on the best of days, but there's something about a charismatic cult leader, a child in this case, that strikes us as even more horrifying. In the dream, the Lord did come to me, and he was a shape. It was he who walks behind the rose. Actor John Franklin does an incredible job portraying a corrupt, power-mad adolescent. Thanks to his performance, the film becomes less about the horror of a cornfield demon and more about the dangers of charismatic leaders with frightening ulterior motives. Beep beep, what's worse than buying a new car only to find out it's pure evil? Uh, nothing, actually. Christine is a unique horror film that takes something as mundane as a car and turns it into an unstoppable killing machine. Christine isn't one of the most popular King adaptations, but it's still a pretty intense thrill ride. And the film is certainly worth giving a whirl. Okay. Show me. While it's obviously impossible for an inanimate object to convey emotion, director John Carpenter and his star Keith Gordon are great at making it seem like Christine has a personality all her own, however terrifying that personality may be. Fun fact, the film's famous resurrection scene almost didn't happen on screen. Carpenter added it after production wrapped because he felt the movie needed more special effects. Stephen King is an absolute master when it comes to turning life's everyday comforts into total nightmares. Cujo tells the story of Donna and Tad, a mother and son who are forced into a hot, broken-down car by a rabid St. Bernard that's quite literally foaming at the mouth. The film turns out to be less about a killer dog and more about human relationships and childhood trauma, and Cujo comes to represent all the terrible things that are happening in Donna's family. Also, what's more frightening than watching a lovable creature turn into a bloodthirsty monster? monster, and through no fault of his own. At the beginning of the film, Cujo is a sweet, curious dog who simply winds up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Oh, and speaking of being in the wrong place at the wrong time… <laughs> Throughout the film, the audience feels a real sense of helplessness as they watch the creature transform before their eyes, and that sense of helplessness soon turns to utter horror. Mothers can be monstrous, in real life and in the movies, and as far as bad mamas go, you'd be hard-pressed to find a mother as depraved and dangerous as Carrie's Margaret White. She's a religious zealot who feels an overwhelming compulsion to punish her daughter Carrie at every turn, calling her a sinner whenever she gets the chance. She's also fond of locking poor Carrie in a prayer closet, essentially a broom closet adorned with candles and religious icons, including the creepiest crucifix you've ever seen. When Carrie gets her first period, Margaret tells her it's because she's had impure thoughts. Oh, Lord! Help the sinning woman see the sin of her days and ways! At the end of the day, she's an all-around miserable person who thinks sex and sexuality is sinful and revolting. Of course, Margaret gets hers in the end, because having a telekinetic daughter who throws knives with her mind isn't without its risks. But while she's alive, man, Margaret is a friggin' nightmare. Kurt Barlow from Salem's Lot is the quintessential boogeyman. The vampire is barely seen throughout the two-part miniseries, which had a theatrical release in Europe, preferring to prey on the people of Salem's Lot under a veil of darkness and chic mystique. But when he finally does show his face, he's a decidedly unsexy vampire. There's no mistaking him for Edward Cullen. I'm going to kill you! <sighs> Barlow is more akin to Nosferatu's central creep, another repulsive monster who doesn't waste time trying to charm his victims. Barlow keeps his eye on the prize and just focuses on what he does best, terrorizing the townspeople. Hey, look at him! 
When he was alive, Pet Cemetery's Gage Creed was a real cute little kid, but after a fatal accident involving an 18-wheeler, his father made the perfect worst choice and decided to go ahead and reanimate him. The result of all this inadvisable hocus pocus is not so cute. I'm glad to something, mommy. Okay, maybe he's still pretty cute. Nevertheless, he turns into a murderous zombie with a fondness for scalpels. He sneaks, he creeps, you'll always find him in the most unexpected places. Basically, he's a full-fledged menace who must be stopped. In the end, Gage's odd mixture of childlike innocence and unstoppable evil adds up to pure, unadulterated nightmare fuel. As a wise man once said, Sometimes, dad is better. Gage is the embodiment of corrupted innocence. A victim of unfortunate circumstances, his transformation into a tiny monster is ultimately the byproduct of his father's grief. In that regard, Pet Cemetery is a terribly sad film, on top of being absolutely terrifying. Let's face it, most insects and arachnids are pretty off-putting in real life. The mere sight of a creepy crawly is a surefire way to get the blood pumping, a fact that horror directors are all too happy to exploit. Well, the creatures in the mist are all supersized, and so is your mounting sense of dread. Just take a look at this angry militia of creepos if you don't believe us. Most of the action in the mist takes place in a single location, a store that suddenly become enveloped in a thick, mysterious fog. Most of the people trapped inside are loath to venture out. Those who do explore the mist end up meeting horrible fates. The mist monsters are otherworldly creatures that go sight unseen throughout much of the film. But when we finally do catch a glimpse, it's not a happy sight. Oh. Those oversized tentacles are not for the faint of heart, and the sharp pinchers should give you a pause, too. They're ghastly, malevolent monsters, and it's really best to avoid them. There's certainly no reasoning with them. Just try talking some sense into this guy. These monsters are seemingly unstoppable, too. The only way to save yourself from a gruesome death is to fight back, and that's way easier said than done. Looking for a life of fame and glory? Well, Annie Wilkes will make you think twice about that. Misery tells the story of Paul Sheldon, a famous writer who's taken in by a seemingly gregarious nurse following a serious car accident. Annie is all too willing to help Paul get back on his feet, but she's also happy to break his ankles. After all, she's his number one fan, and she feels things very strongly. I'm also a nurse. And in case you haven't caught on yet, she's also a total friggin' psychopath. There! Look there! See what you made me do! Wilkes holds the poor writer hostage, forcing him to rewrite his latest book in a way that she deems satisfying and appropriate. No profanity, no cheap endings, and when he tries to escape this horrible predicament, she hobbles him with a sledgehammer, all the while assuring him that she's his biggest fan. Annie is easily one of Stephen King's most frightening villains, and part of what makes her so terrifying is Kathy Bates' incredible performance. She rightfully earned an Oscar for her work, and it's easy to see why Total Film said, Annie Wilkes is one of cinema's greatest, friendliest monsters. Indeed, part of what makes Annie so awful is the fact that she really does love Paul. But when admiration turns into obsession, there's no telling what a person is capable of doing, and Annie is apparently willing to do anything, no matter how wretched it is. The 1980 film adaptation of The Shining is a bona fide horror masterpiece. Director Stanley Kubrick created a ghostly and ghastly world inside the Overlook Hotel, and his utterly terrifying film is widely considered an essential, iconic piece of horror cinema. The story revolves around a writer and family man who loses his mind inside a haunted hotel, which sounds somewhat straightforward at first, but there's a lot going on here. Though Kubrick's vision is something of a departure from Stephen King's original novel, his take on the haunted hotel hotel has unspeakable horrors waiting behind every door, and just around every corner. As the story goes, the Overlook Hotel was apparently built on an Indian burial ground, and any horror fan knows that's never a good sign. Throughout the film, the formidable building establishes itself as something of a villain in its own right. It really feels like a living, breathing entity with blood on its mind. The ghosts that seem to inhabit the property are all deranged and diabolical in one way or another. There are elevators full of blood, ballrooms teeming with ghosts specters, and who the hell knows what's going on in room 237?
From the Grady twins to these two fine fellows, there's something to fear on every floor of the Overlook Hotel. You can run, but you can't hide. Though the spectral hotel guests at the Overlook Hotel are admittedly creepy, it's questionable whether any of them can physically harm you. Still, there's no doubt they'll drive you towards madness using every trick at their disposal. Case in point, Jack Torrance, who totally loses his mind throughout the course of the film. He starts out as a deeply frustrated husband and father who seems to have a rather short fuse, but he slowly transforms into a genuine monster, a monster who happens to be highly proficient with an axe. Here's Johnny! <laughs> Taking the job at the Overlook proves to be Jack's undoing. We watch helplessly as he loses his grip on reality, and sometimes it feels like we're losing it right along with him. He becomes more and more terrifying with every scene, and when he finally meets his demise, there's something truly awful in that frozen grimace, and the vision stays with us long after the final frame of the film. Of course, that final frame is creepy in its own right. If you were a child in the 90s, there's a good chance you caught the IT miniseries starring Tim Curry as the child-eating Pennywise the Dancing Clown. Come on, bucko. I'm not supposed to take stuff from strangers. My dad said so. Very wise of your dad. Curry's Pennywise was a villain that made kids afraid to turn off their bedroom lights. Not just because clowns are inherently awful, but because this clown can manifest as your greatest fear. He can also get to you quite easily, wherever you happen to be. Although the IT miniseries has arguably lost a bit of its bite in recent years, Pennywise the Dancing Clown is still a force to be reckoned with. In the recent IT films, Bill Skarsgård takes on the meaty role and his interpretation is dazzlingly demented in its own right. The pancake makeup, the teeth, that hideous dance. <laughs> the new Pennywise is the perfect villain for these troubling times. At the end of the day, we all get the monsters we deserve. The Walking Dead has no shortage of bad guys, big and small. But who's the biggest, baddest antagonist of them all? We're here to find out by ranking every single major Walking Dead villain from the least impressive to the most brutally fearsome. First introduced in Season 7, Jadis is the leader of a faction known as the Scavengers. Rick approaches them in the hopes of gaining more soldiers in his fight against Negan and the Saviors. Jadis is depicted as a curt, cold leader of a handful of loyal survivors. She lives in a junkyard where she often makes art out of the items that are discarded and chooses to speak in broken English. Still. Alone you need us to save you. Although her eccentricities make Jadis, whose real name is later revealed to be Anne, irritating, they're not the reason she ranks as one of the worst villains on the show. When push comes to shove, Jadis's move is always to extort something out of the people she has power over. When Rick comes with his hat in his hand, she demands some kind of tribute. When she agrees to fight alongside him, she eventually betrays the Alexandrians and joins the Saviors, only to later betray them when the tide of the battle shifts. In the end, she makes one greedy choice too many, and her entire group is massacred by the Saviors at the behest of Simon. Her time as a villain is marked by perplexing character traits and an inability to really impact the outcome of the world. When Gregory is introduced, he seems like an impressive figure. He's run the Hilltop Colony since the beginning and by Season 6, it stands as one of the few safe havens left in the world. However, as the world grows and alliances start to form, it becomes clear that Gregory is only a peacetime leader, and a very average one at that. When the Saviors first arrive, he's unable to put up much of a fight and almost immediately rolls over. Once Rick comes around, he realizes that his people need some muscle and agrees to help, right up until Rick loses his first battle with the Saviors. He then declares their deal null and void, after that, Maggie gains popularity as a leader among Hilltop residents, prompting Gregory to attempt to defect to the Saviors. Perhaps you've already noticed the pattern here? Gregory gives up at the drop of a hat. Whenever things get real, he simply quits and joins the other team, bouncing back and forth between the good guys and bad guys and having little impact on either faction. You're really gonna stand there and pretend you didn't try to sell us out, sell this place out to the Saviors? I was working for the side of sanity. I was working for peace. Hero or villain, a person in the world of The Walking Dead has to make big moves that might lead to conflict. Even if he's no fighter, maintaining control is key. And Gregory, from the get-go, never really has control of anyone or anything. 
It's rare that a villainous group on The Walking Dead has no distinct leader, but such is the case with the Wolves. The Wolves are a group of marauders active in the Washington, D.C. area who survive by raiding any living people for supplies, then using their zombified bodies as bait to attract more prey. They foster a sense of unease in the area by marking areas they've hit with the words, Wolves Not Far. Yet theatrics don't end there. They carve a W into both their foreheads and the foreheads of their victims. For all their style, the Wolves don't last very long against Rick's group, or even Carol on her own. In Season 6, after teasing their presence in the area for weeks, they launch a full-on attack on Alexandria. In the end, however, their attack on Alexandria is nothing more than a surprisingly toothless display of intimidation. Carol, disguised as a wolf, successfully slaughters a number of them, and the Alexandrians are able to repel their forces. So much for the wolves' ferocity. You said it, right? Don't ever be sorry. All things considered, Gareth is actually a pretty savvy villain. Not only does he lead a large faction of people, he manages to hatch a pretty clever scheme that brings a lot of unsuspecting victims into his web. After founding Terminus as a safe haven, Gareth's good intentions are foiled by a group of hostile survivors who briefly take over. He manages to get the place back, but only by resorting to villainous tactics. Following this, Gareth grows merciless and turns his little beacon of hope into a trap for people in the area who hear radio broadcasts hailing Terminus as a sanctuary. In reality, it's a meat factory for cannibals. If it makes you feel any better, you taste much better than we thought you would. The only reason Gareth ranks so low on this list is simply that his villainy doesn't last long in the face of Rick Grimes and his survivors. After Gareth captures the group and attempts to slaughter them for meat, Rick and company manage to escape and take Terminus out. With everything he built in ruins, Gareth tracks them to a nearby church and manages to capture Bob. Ultimately, though, his tracking amounts to nothing, as Rick makes good on his promise to kill him with a red-handled machete. Gareth is neither the most cunning nor the most threatening villain on The Walking Dead, but he does manage to build something worthy of infamy. Unfortunately, his contribution to the world ends there. Dwight is an enormously complicated villain. However, that complexity somewhat diminishes his level of success as a bad guy. His heart just isn't in it. Dwight is introduced as someone who betrays Daryl's kindness on the road after fleeing the saviors with his wife and sister-in-law. Eventually, the family returns, and Negan separates Dwight from his wife and burns half his face off with an iron for his desertion. After enduring this trauma and spending a good portion of time in solitary confinement, Dwight emerges as one of Negan's top guys. He's reintroduced to the survivors after he mercilessly shoots Denise through the eye and is part of the team that captures the survivors before Abraham and Glenn are executed by Negan. Basically, Dwight is an irredeemable bastard at this point in the story. However, his love for his wife keeps a singular spark of humanity alive within him, and eventually, he makes the bold choice to turn on Negan and the saviors and act as a mole for the Alexandrians. I hate him. I hate Negan. For a time, Dwight is a pretty captivating figure to watch, because it's genuinely unclear where his loyalties lie. In the end, he makes the tough call to do the right thing, and Daryl spares his life as a result. He's one of The Walking Dead's more understated antagonists, and that makes him a relatively minor figure on this list, but definitely not in the hearts of the show's fans. While Joe never leads a large group like Jadis, Gareth, or the Wolves, he gets major points for being a seriously evil person. He's first introduced as the leader of a very small group of marauders called the Claimers. They roll into a house that Rick happens to be hiding out in and quickly demonstrate their depravity. Rick manages to escape them, but not without killing a Claimer. While tracking Rick down for revenge, Joe meets and befriends Daryl and explains his philosophy on leadership. Joe manages to keep his small group in line by issuing one major rule. Anyone who claims something owns it by right. Those who violate this rule are punished with a beating, or worse. The claimers are a small faction because Joe deals with internal conflicts by straight up killing the person who is at fault. When Joe catches up to Rick, he threatens to kill Daryl and assault both Michonne and Carl. He genuinely gets one over on Rick, but only briefly, because Joe underestimates his opponent's savagery. Rick rips out Joe's throat with his teeth, putting an end to his misguided worldview right then and there. Oh, hard, I never looked at it like that. Seems to me like things are finally starting to fall together. At least for guys like us. 
Sometimes, the scariest villains are the ones who are convinced they're the good guy. When Dawn is introduced, she's several years into the apocalypse, but is still holding out hope for a government rescue. Dawn presides over a hospital that she and a handful of other survivors, cops, and physicians have turned into a very tense safe haven. With resources dwindling, Dawn allows all sorts of horrific crimes, all in the name of keeping their way of life going until a government rescue arrives. This is, as the audience knows, a long wait for a train that simply isn't coming. Try to look at the good we're doing. Hard as it was, we saved Joan's life, Trevitt's life, we saved your life. When Beth arrives as a patient, she's given a crash course in Dawn's deeply and profoundly misguided way of leading. When Beth befriends a guy named Noah, they hatch a plan that half fails and only allows him to escape. While Beth stays back and faces the consequences from one of Dawn's men, it becomes clear that Dawn is losing control, prompting her to do something drastic. When Beth's group comes to negotiate a trade for Beth and Carol, who has been injured and brought to the hospital, Dawn tries to prove herself by demanding they get Noah back as well. Driven to madness by her brief time with Dawn, Beth stabs her. Dawn reflexively shoots her and is immediately shot dead by Daryl. The governor, aka Philip Blake, deserves high honors for being the Walking Dead's very first through and through, honest to God villain. Prior to his arrival, the worst threat to humanity is Merle Dixon. When Daryl's brother is finally seen again after more than a year, he's following the governor's orders which really says something about the company Blake keeps. When the governor is introduced, he is revealed to have accomplished what Rick has failed to do. He has created a working society within the zombie apocalypse. While the show has since seen a bevy of strongholds from both good guys and bad guys take shape, the governor is the first to do it. It's not exactly a success, however. Things get very dystopian there, only about a year or two out from the onset of the apocalypse. You know all about me and I know all about you. I don't care about any of that. We're here to move forward. What really makes the governor a top villain isn't his leadership, but his madness. There's just no telling how he'll wield his power from moment to moment. Even his demise comes as a result of his own lunacy. Upset over the loss of Woodbury and its people's assimilation into the prison, he drives a tank through one of the only safe havens left in the world and dies trying to exact physical revenge on Rick Grimes. Alpha is curt, cold, and has no time for any weakness in her ranks. She survives by leading a group called the Whisperers, who live among the Walkers and even manage to control their movements through herding tactics. She is the first to recognize that the Walkers are the weapon that brought humanity to its knees, making even the mightiest people and institutions fall. So when she encounters Rick's group, she has very little time for their emotionality and moral compunctions. However, since they've captured her only daughter, Lydia, she has no choice but to roll through them with brutal vengeance. The war with the Whisperers becomes one of the strongest conflicts in the series. Though Beta, Alpha's right-hand man, does most of the heavy lifting. She's the one who herds enough walkers to basically wield this world's equivalent of a nuke. Alpha is one of very few villains on The Walking Dead who doesn't underestimate her opponents, and that counts for everything. They all follow me by choice, because I make them strong. Even people with a cursory understanding of The Walking Dead know that Negan is the greatest antagonist the show has ever seen. Although he spends a majority of his time on the show on a path to redemption, he wouldn't even be alive if it wasn't for his ruthlessness. When Negan is first introduced, he infamously kills Abraham and Glenn for no other reason than to demonstrate his power. Negan has a twisted way of always making good decisions. He views people as a resource. This means he's not a loose cannon homicidal maniac like the governor or Joe. His conflicts are calculated, and he knows who will live or die before he even begins a conversation. When it comes to leadership, he defers from Jadis and Dawn in that he knows success lies not in keeping people going, but in giving them an opportunity to thrive. Hence, the Sanctuary's point system. Let Mark's face be a daily reminder to him and to everyone else that the rules matter. However, the main thing that makes Negan such an effective villain is the fact that he's capable. Unlike Gregory or Don, when push comes to shove, Negan can fend for himself. He boasts the smartest and most broken mind in any room and is enormously capable of exerting his will on the people around him. From tracksuits that have seen better days to slick vinyl catsuits, we're here to investigate what DC's bad guys actually look like in the comics they still call home, and just how different that is from what makes it onto the silver screen. 
The Joker has a pretty packed wardrobe. Batman t-shirts? He's sporting them in Sean Murphy's miniseries, Batman White Knight. Sleeveless doctor's coat? Joker donned one in Batman R.I.P. Still, over the decades, a central look emerges. Classic suits and tuxedos in green, orange, purple, and red. He first appeared in a large bow tie, purple gloves, and well-pomaded hair. Though artists often add a couple of unhinged details to his look, most often must hair or outsized teeth, the Joker tends to keep himself as well turned out as a Downton Abbey character. Modern movie audiences have three very different Jokers to consider. Heath Ledger's clown is a mangy monstrosity whose makeup visually flakes off throughout the movie. Joaquin Phoenix's take on the character looks to famous mid-century television clowns like Bozo and Howdy Doody's Clarabelle for inspiration. Jared Leto's demonic wild child swaps formal wear for face tattoos and lurid purple coats over a bare chest. Each of these interpretations tells the audience something different. Leto's Joker is more of a mafioso than a mastermind, Phoenix's Joker is a 1970s everyman gone off the deep end, and Ledger's Joker is a nightmarish vision of urban decay. But not one of them is as sharply dressed as the madman of the monthlies. Some of those movie guys are just a mess. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? Doomsday's appeal is pretty much summed up by his name. He is the reckoning at the end of Superman's adventures. Appropriately, he is best known as the villain of the death of Superman. The result of alien scientist Krypton's genetic engineering, Doomsday is a gray goliath whose skeleton spikes through his skin. Doomsday's incarnation in Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice was a very different creature indeed. The product of Lex Luthor's meddling with General Zod's corpse, this Doomsday was as large and gray as his comic counterpart, but not quite as hard-edged. Though spikes of bone emerged mid-battle from his skin, he starts out as a deformed gray brute. Moreover, this Doomsday developed the ability to shoot blasts of energy out of his hands after absorbing the energy from a nuclear strike. The Doomsday of the comics only develops this ability after his faithful battle with the Outsiders super team. Doomsday on film is a grunting, primal version of brutality, something like the distant ancestor of the comics version. The feline fatale likes to keep it sleek. The Catwoman of the 1966 Batman TV series accentuated basic black with glittering accessories and a striking mask. Batman Returns imagined Catwoman as a city girl pushed to madness, symbolized by her visibly stitched patchwork of the catsuit. Halle Berry's costume was shredded, but still as dark as the shadows. The Dark Knight Rises depicted Catwoman as a burglar in matte black with pointed stilettos and cat-eared tips on her goggles. These incarnations, though impressive in their cinematic vision, rely on small details to do the heavy lifting of her characterization. But the Catwoman of the comics has a more varied wardrobe, ranging from emerald evening wear to royal purple catsuits. For all that, Trail of the Catwoman artist Darwin Cook's 2001 redesign was so immediately iconic. In it, Catwoman wears a simple cat suit and a cat-eared cowl, set off by flat-footed motorcycle boots and flared goggles. It's simple and remarkably practical, but its sleek details make it timeless. Catwoman's taste might run to the extravagant, but when she's on the job, she keeps things functional. What are we gonna do? There's not much we can do. That's who I think it is. Being the literal god of war requires an impressive outfit. Ares does just that in the 2017 Wonder Woman film. With shining armor, spiked helmet, and enormous weaponry, war sure ain't subtle. Ares of the comics follows suit. In George Perez's classic tale on Wonder Woman and Greg Ruka and Nicola Scott's recent revival, he wears dark blue armor, a plumed helmet, and a billowing cape. It's largely the same design as what ended up on screen, aside from one important difference. In the early comics, Ares has no discernible body. Every inch of flesh is covered, save a narrow gap in his helmet. On any normal human, this would reveal a portion of the nose, lips, and chin. On the comic character, however, there is only depthless darkness, studded with two smoldering eyes. Was it cool to see the man who played mild manner Remus Lupin glowering beneath the helmet? Yes, but it would have been equally striking to see his face disappear after doing away with his disguise. 
Remember when the villain of Suicide Squad opened an apocalyptic portal through the art of aggressive belly dancing? And in Chantress's defense, when you're a millennia-spanning interdimensional witch goddess, you can pretty much make your own rules. That certainly applied to the character's wardrobe, which shifted from rags and tarnished jewelry to a billowing two-piece affair, crowned by a rune-inlaid headdress. Was it an outfit made for serious battle? No way. But Enchantress's powers allow her to do other things. Uh, uh, please don't touch me. Please don't touch me. Introduced in a 1966 issue of Strange Adventures as the Switcheroo Witcheroo, the Enchantress has cycled through many outfits, but all of them are in her signature bright green and most feature a flamboyant cloak. Perhaps her most unique costume is her very first, a classic witch hat paired with a harlequin-patterned mini-dress. Not great for Suicide Squad, but perfect for the swinging 60s. Dr. Poison is one of Wonder Woman's earliest villains, and one of her most terrifying. A princess working as the head of the Nazis' poison division, she disguises her gender under her green doctor's gear and a mask with a rictus grin. Her greatest creation was Reverso, a poison that would force allied soldiers into doing the opposite of what they were told. Dr. Poison isn't a princess in disguise as a man or working with Nazis in 2017's Wonder Woman, but she is just as deadly. In an intriguing twist, Dr. Poison's mask was reimagined as a series of flesh-colored plates, affixed to her face to hide the scars exposure to her own creations wrought. Those plates aren't just striking, but rooted in actual history. Soldiers disfigured in World War I brought about new innovations in prosthesis. Dr. Poison might not have been the leering specter of the axe as she began as, but she filled Wonder Woman audiences with a comparable sense of terror. DC's new gods exceeded conventional notions of superheroes. They've got fabulous powers, extravagant outfits, and wheeled technology capable of transporting them across dimensions. Steppenwolf is a new god, and his incarnation in the Justice League lived up to that race's larger-than-life reputation. He was a CGI colossus of armor, stone, and steel. Beneath his costume, he was oddly waxen in appearance, his skin a drained gray crisscrossed by alien grooves. Add in two bony outgrowths off his chin, and you had a truly fearsome-looking opponent. Power. And power is the only law. The Steppenwolf of modern comics is similarly grand, but he didn't start out that way. He first appears in the New Gods series sporting green medieval armor, complete with a bicocket hat that makes him look more Robin Hood than New God. But in modern renditions, his armor is red and black, accented by a skull worn at his waist and red, claw-like stripes atop his shoulders. In sharp contrast to the Steppenwolf of the movies, however, his comic incarnation is notably handsome. He wears a dark beard, sometimes twisted into long braids. Movie Steppenwolf is utterly unknowable, while comic Steppenwolf is a man who, dressed differently, could pass for a hero. As a kid whose powers allow him to transform into a buff, super-heroic adult in a flashy red suit, Shazam embodies one of the most potent fantasies in all of comics. Appropriately, his archenemy, Dr. Savannah, is boldly drawn. Dr. Savannah, a criminal mastermind whose love of depraved science is matched only by his ego. Give me your power. Or die. His appearance in Shazam isn't too terribly far off the mark, as in the comics, he is portrayed as a bald, smirking man who oozes ill intentions. But unlike the villain Mark Strong portrayed on screen, the Dr. Savannah of the comics is a hunched little man with an oversized head. His thick glasses obscure his eyes, which, paired with the old-school lab coat he favors, create nothing so much as the very image of the mad scientist. Add in the diabolical alien worm, Mr. Mind, he is often seen with, and it all results in a man you'd give a wide berth to on the street. Raz al Ghul didn't become the head of the League of Assassins through subtlety. He clawed his way to power over the course of centuries, infiltrated the halls of the wealthy and connected through genius and determination, and sired Talia al Ghul, herself one of Batman's most formidable foes. Accordingly, he cuts a fine figure. Raz adorns his roguish good looks with emerald green capes bordered in gold, intricately wrought jewelry, and often a lush length of fur. Liam Neeson's portrayal in Batman Begins is a dramatic departure from this rich refinement. 
There, Roz blends into the shadows through muted suits and dark training gear. He is less the distant master of a thousand deadly hands and more the hands themselves, seeking to add Bruce Wayne to his ranks through subterfuge. You haven't beaten me. You've sacrificed sure footing for a killing stroke. Though his subdued aesthetic is indeed appropriate to that approach, one can't help but miss the flamboyance of his comic incarnation. The man who had become Ocean Master was born to power. He's the type of guy who likes to refer to his trident as a scepter and dresses accordingly. Orm wears purple scaled armor, a finned helmet that covers his eyes with black-red oblongs, and a cape, even underwater. Ocean Master's final costume in Aquaman is actually pretty darn close to what he wears in the comics, including the cape. But that resplendent outfit comes only at the end of the film, during the final face-off, and is preceded by a host of other extravagant costumes. He begins with dark armor of considerably more bulk than the sleek looks favored by the other denizens of Atlantis. Later, he dons another set of armor wrought entirely of gold, topped off by a thinned crown. Orm's costumes send one very clear message. He is to be obeyed, and he wants everyone to know it. Supervillain gimmicks range wildly in fearsomeness. Sometimes you get the Joker, essentially the embodiment of chaos. And sometimes, well, you get a guy like Captain Boomerang. No one is exactly surprised to see a guy named Captain Boomerang in a well-worn tracksuit and pop-collar trench coat and Suicide Squad, missing a few teeth and sporting some facial scars. He's a guy who revels in being weird and even a little off-putting. The kind of oddball who fits in right alongside Killer Croc and Harley Quinn. Captain Boomerang is just as weird in the comics, but with a good deal more panache. Rather than a ratty tracksuit, he began as a man in a boomerang pattern tunic, ascot, and jaunty blue garrison cap. Though recent incarnations have favored a more toned-down look, his looks remain well-cut and elegant, and often still incorporate boomerang patterns and an ascot. He might be strange, but he's gonna look good doing it, even when he's bothering his teammates with his boorishness and hijinks. One can only imagine the horror Captain Boomerang of the comics would feel upon glimpsing his motley film self, to say nothing of the latter's preoccupation with unicorns. Nothing transforms a good movie villain into a great one like a killer wardrobe, a badass backstory, and a compelling argument. These villains all had a pretty good point, even if we were too busy hating them to realize it. We should say up front that we firmly believe the Dark Knight's Joker to be a raving sociopath and an absolute menace to society. But, hear us out, it's sometimes hard to argue with his philosophy that human beings are not meant to be confined within a structured society. And yes, human beings find ways to remind us of the delicate nature of social contracts every day. You see, this is how crazy Batman's made Gotham. You want order in Gotham. Batman must take off his mask and turn himself in. Oh, and every day he doesn't, people will die. Joker's fairy versus fairy experiment may have failed to bring Gotham to its knees, but that doesn't mean he wasn't right about a certain Gothamite's nature. Yup, we're talking about D.A. Harvey Dent, better known as Two-Face. Joker tortured the noble lawmen emotionally and physically early in the film before breaking Dent's psyche and turning him loose on a coin-flipping killing spree. Bringing Gotham's golden boy down into the trenches with the rest of the city's criminals was Joker's masterpiece. It was only tarnished by Batman and Chief Gordon spinning the biggest web of lies that Gotham has ever seen, which sort of feels like a loss for the supposed good guys. Count yourself lucky if you are not the leader of the free world when the apocalypse begins. That's just where Carl Anheuser found himself when the end began in the brainless disaster flick 2012. Just exactly how long are these things expecting to hold us in place, Captain? They're just meant to withstand the first impact of the waves, Mr. Anheuser. While Anheuser was an antagonistic presence throughout the film, he didn't achieve full-on villain status until he thwarted the heroic efforts of Jackson Curtis to save his family by unceremoniously slamming the door to salvation in the Curtis family's collective faces. It's a brutal moment to be sure, but it's important to remember that if Anheuser hadn't shut the doors, the world-ending flood outside might have found its way in. It would have killed all the would-be survivors aboard the Ark, and that would have meant the end of humanity. So yeah, Anheuser could have been nicer about everything, but seriously, he had to close those doors. 
Sure, Daniel Craig plays an excellent Bond, but the success of 2012's box office smashing Skyfall owes a lot to Javier Bardem's performance as scorned secret agent turned vengeful cyber terrorist Raul Silva. While there's no question that Silva falls on the baddie side of the spectrum, he's also, well, a human. A terrible, awful, no good human, but a human nonetheless. I win. What do you say to that? It's a waste of good scotch. He's talented, sure, and he's hyper-intelligent, but he's also tortured. Sound familiar? There are definite parallels between Silva, a former MI6 agent who was abandoned to be tortured by the Chinese, and Bond. In fact, it was Silva's sympathetic backstory that attracted Bardem to the part. The actor told Fox News, Here there is a broken person. What I like the most is there is a clear motive. We understand he is very human and this is powerful. I was attracted to the villain because I thought he was a nice guy. I could see it in his eyes." We're not sure we agree with Bardem, but we'll admit Silva's about as sympathetic as Bond villains get, and that's got to count for something. You see, we are the last two rats. We can either eat each other or eat everyone else. He was one of the biggest action heroes of the day, but if Top Gun were real life, there's no way that Tom Cruise's Pete Maverick Mitchell would be a popular guy. The antagonist of the 80s classic, Val Kilmer's Tom Iceman Kazansky, on the other hand, very well might be. As top dog at the Naval Air Station Miramar Top Gun School, he spent years training to be the best young pilot around. So of course he's going to have a problem when this upstart maverick turns up and displays a blatant disregard for everyone's safety. You guys really are cowboys. What's your problem, Kazansky? You're everyone's problem. That's because every time you go up in the air, you're unsafe. At one stage, reports emerged suggesting that Cruz and Kilmer's onset relationship mirrored that of their characters. But if there was ever any truth to this, then it's clearly all water under the bridge, as the pair are reuniting for Top Gun 2. Kilmer was sidelined with throat cancer for a while, but he has revealed that he's fit and well enough to reprise the role of Iceman in the upcoming sequel. I don't like you because you're dangerous. That's right. Ice man. I am dangerous. Everyone loves a good villain, and Disney's baddies are among the most beloved and feared in all of cinema. But while their hideous scowls and evil plans are more than enough to scare the kids, there are a few aspects to these villains that only adults will pick up on. It's hard to forget Ursula, the big bad of 1989's The Little Mermaid. With her particularly deceitful scheme, her eel henchmen, and her instantly iconic music number, Poor Unfortunate Souls. Ursula has easily become one of the most distinct members of the Disney villain canon. But something else sets Ursula apart from her fellow Disney baddies, and that's her real-life inspiration. Of all people, Ursula had her design based on the famous drag queen and actor, Divine. So just how did the star of raunchy John Waters movies like Pink Flamingos and Multiple Maniacs come to inspire the villain of a G-rated Disney musical? Well, animator Rob Minkoff drew up a design of Ursula that ended up bearing a strong resemblance to Divine. Little Mermaid composer Howard Ashman, a major fan of both John Waters and Divine, strongly endorsed the design choice. Disney's other animators took further visual influence from Divine by giving Ursula a hairstyle similar to the one donned by the drag queen in Pink Flamingos. The connection between the two only grew as Ashman committed to channeling Divine's uber-confident persona into Ursula's performance during Poor Unfortunate Souls. The Hunchback of Notre Dame broke down many barriers in the world of Disney animation. For one thing, this 1996 adaptation of Victor Hugo's novel explicitly tackled the subject of religion, which no other film in the studio's canon has done. For another, it gave a truly adult motivation to its antagonist, Claude Frollo. As in Hugo's original novel, Frollo is a studious justice minister who frowns upon anything sexual in nature. However, the character of Esmeralda, a person Frollo publicly refers to as disgusting filth, stirs up feelings of passion inside Frollo's heart. His internal conflict over these forbidden emotions becomes so great that his villain musical number, Hellfire, is fixated on him begging for forgiveness from God for feeling such intense lust. Where other Disney villains are motivated by greed or revenge, 
Frollo's crisis is dictated entirely by his sexuality. This is unexpectedly bold storytelling territory from Disney, a studio that spent the 1990s releasing more explicit kitty fare like this. Mm. Earthwormy goodness. Indeed, upon its initial release, the Los Angeles Times reported letters from parents questioning the movie's darker material, including Frollo's internal conflict, or too adult for a kid's movie. Nonetheless, by daring to give its villains such a complex and mature motivation, The Hunchback of Notre Dame was able to solidify itself as one of the more unique and underrated Disney animations. Over the years, everyone from Claude Rains to Oscar Isaac has portrayed Robin Hood's greedy nemesis Prince John. So when it was time for Disney to take on the story of Robin Hood, it was inevitable that the filmmakers were going to create their own unique version of the character. And in Disney's 1973 animated classic, John is portrayed as a cowardly thumb-sucking lion, voiced by two-time Academy Award winner Peter Ustinov. Disney's Prince John quickly became one of the most iconic versions of the character, and for obvious reasons one of the silliest and most cartoonish too. So much so, in fact, that it can be easy to forget that Prince John was, in fact, a real historical figure. Long before the release of Disney's film, King John ruled over England for 17 years, between 1199 and 1216. Sadly, there's little historical evidence connecting John and the semi-mythical figure of Robin Hood in the real world. However, the frequently antagonistic depiction of John in pop culture stems from how he has been commonly regarded as one of England's worst kings. As far as kings go, John didn't have a lot going for him. He lost critical lands in France, sent England into financial ruin, and most famously of all was forced to sign the Magna Carta after facing a revolt from his own barons. John quickly cultivated a toxic reputation amongst contemporaries, one that survives to this day in stories like Robin Hood. So, while children will appreciate Disney's take on Prince John as a particularly silly entry into the pantheon of Disney villains, the grown-ups will be more than aware of the real man, who presented an equally real danger to his own people. Unlike most animated Disney movies, Pocahontas is actually based on a true story. However, its deviations from reality have inspired a decent amount of criticism over the years, including the lack of evidence for there having been a romantic relationship between John Smith and Pocahontas. And one of the more significant changes in the movie's plot can be found in the fate of its villain, John Ratcliffe. In Disney's Pocahontas, Ratcliffe is depicted as a gold-hungry captain who puts his own selfish interests above all else, including the safety of the indigenous Americans. And with his love of money, power, and flamboyant fashion sense, Ratcliffe fits nicely alongside his fellow Disney villains. Unlike most Disney villains, however, Ratcliffe is based on an actual person. The real Ratcliffe was an early settler to America who eventually became the second president of the Jamestown colony. Whereas Pocahontas depicts Ratcliffe being tied up and taken back to England to pay for his crimes, however, the actual Ratcliffe was killed by Powhatan Indians. Of course, Pocahontas is a film more interested in using the details of America's settlement as a springboard for its own story rather than adhering to the specific factual details of the era. And although it's nice to see a little dash of reality in a story like this, it's probably best not to go looking to Disney movies for historical accuracy. One of the most striking segments in the 1940 film Fantasia is entitled Night on Bald Mountain. Set to the piece of music of the same name, the short depicts a gigantic, monstrous being awakening an assortment of spirits. Eventually, the spirits and the beast are held at bay at the sound of the pealing bells and a chorus of monks singing Ave Maria. Though never given a name in Fantasia itself, the beast at the center of Night on Bald Mountain is named Chernabog. Adult viewers well-versed in ancient mythology will recognize Chernabog's name as one derived from the world of Slavic myths. Specifically, Chernabog's name means Black God, and he's also known as the Lord of Evil, a creature whose deeds were too wicked to be told in classic mythology. Interestingly, another ancient being also seems to have played a part in inspiring Chernabog. 
In Fantasia, the host Deems Taylor refers to Chernobog as Satan. Bald Mountain, according to tradition, is the gathering place of Satan and his followers. Though the character is officially named Chernobog, design similarities between Fantasia's Chernobog and the traditional depiction of Satan are apparent, particularly in their horned heads. And while Night on Bald Mountain turned out to be a distinctive enough endeavor to ensure that Chernobog could stand on its own two demonic feet, grown-up viewers should be able to appreciate the terrifying nature of Chernobog's true origins. Some Disney villains yearn for world domination. Some want revenge. Others are motivated by prophecies dictated by magic mirrors. Cruella de Vil, however, is one Disney villain who keeps her aims much simpler. All she wants is to take 99 Dalmatian puppies and turn them into a fur coat. And sure, the scheme concocted by 101 Dalmatian's puppy-fixated antagonists aren't exactly ripped from reality, but the Disney version of author Dodie Smith's legendary villain did take cues from reality through real-life actress Tallulah Bankhead. In a 1985 piece for the Los Angeles Times, animator Mark Davis revealed that Tallulah Bankhead, an actress known for playing intimidating women, was one of the key inspirations for designing Cruella de Vil. Bankhead's influence didn't stop there, though. In the same Los Angeles Times piece, Cruella's voice actor, Betty Lou Gerson, reflected that, In the first recording session, they told me to see what I could come up with. The first voice I tried sounded a bit like Tallulah Bankhead. Everybody said, That's it. Don't change it. Clearly, Disney's iconic take on the character of Cruella de Vil owes a massive tip of the hat to Bankhead. And it's nice to know that the inimitable movie star is still terrifying kids to this day, even if they have no idea who she is. The 2008 Pixar classic WALL-E wears its homages to classic cinema on its sleeve, and one of WALL-E's more explicit references to the movies can be found in the principal villain, one who film fans will be sure to recognize. Auto may be designed to look like a steering wheel, but the robot's gigantic, glowing red circle makes it perfectly apparent that it's supposed to evoke HAL 9000, the villainous computer from 2001 A Space Odyssey. The two carry similar designs, as well as a shared determination to enact their own agendas over the well-being of their human superiors. Otto's connection to 2001 becomes even more explicit in the climactic showdown between the captain and Otto, which employs the Richard Strauss composition, also Sprach Zarathustra. That Strauss piece, of course, was also used to immensely memorable effect in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Otto does, however, depart from Hal in one aspect. Hal was voiced by Douglas Rain and was meant to carry a more human quality than even the movie's flesh and blood characters. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Conversely, Otto is voiced by Macintalk, Apple's text to voice software. This gives Otto the most lifeless voice out of all of Wally's cast. Giving Otto unique qualities compared to Hal ensures that this Wally -E villain can work as a standalone entity for younger viewers and in the process make the character more than just a meaningless parody of 2001. The alien antagonists in 2005's Chicken Little are fluffy, teardrop-shaped critters who look pretty much tailor-made to be sold at your local Disney store. However, these aliens don't reveal their true forms until Chicken Little's final moments. Up until that point, these otherworldly visitors lurk inside large robots that move around on long mechanical legs. Older viewers, of course, will take one look at these machines and realize they have more than a passing resemblance to the antagonists of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. In Wells' seminal work, the alien invaders move around in giant machines known as tripods. In the book, Wells describes the tripods as higher than many houses striding over the young pine trees, a walking engine of glittering metal, striding now across the heather, articulate ropes of steel dangling from it. The same description pretty much matches Chicken Little's own mechanical aliens. This homage proved timely for Chicken Little, too, given that Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds also debuted in 2005, placing the tripods firmly back in the public consciousness. 
The Lion King's villain Scar doesn't exactly hide the fact that he's evil. His contempt for Simba is palpable in their earliest conversations, and he relishes the chance to throw his own brother, Mufasa, off a ledge to his death. But in case anyone in the audience doesn't quite understand the full extent of Scar's cruelty, the Lion King offers up a few visual cues to cement his nefarious nature. During Scar's big Be Prepared musical number, the animators of The Lion King made sure to bask Scar in visual parallels to contemporary Nazi propaganda. Nazi imagery is rife throughout the entirety of Be Prepared, including Scar's hyena henchmen marching in a goose-step formation while Scar looms above them, an arrangement echoing how Adolf Hitler would appear at military parades and rallies. The beams of light surrounding Scar during Be Prepared also evoke the lighting devices used at Nazi rallies, thus creating a very creepy image of a feline Führer. The idea to tie Scar into Nazi imagery came about incidentally through an animator doodling Scar as Hitler. This throwaway picture inspired the visual team behind The Lion King to create Nazi-related visual parallels all throughout the Be Prepared sequence. The result was a sequence that easily reaffirmed the character's evil nature, while also creating some of the movie's most striking imagery. With so many Spider-Man movies out there, there are a lot of Spider-Man villains. We're taking a look back at the many, many supervillains that Spidey's battled against. Beware some gigantic spoilers ahead. Stop the video now if you're not up to date on every Spider movie. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is even more than Spider-Man 3 before it, an overstuffed movie that banks on interconnectivity to help drive excitement for a sequel that ultimately never came. At the time, Sony Pictures was attempting to push ahead with its own cinematic universe with Spider-Man at the heart. When it didn't work, we ended up with Spider-Man in the MCU. Watching The Amazing Spider-Man 2 today is mostly an amusing exercise in seeing someone try to build a universe that never quite comes together. Rhino is, sadly, a victim of this crumbling effort. The film had Paul Giamatti playing a Russian gangster in a mechanical rhino suit, and the actor clearly relished chewing up as much scenery as he possibly could in the role. Sadly, he only appears in a couple of scenes. He might have had more to do with a hypothetical sequel, but here he's largely an example of a wasted opportunity. The version of Green Goblin who shows up in The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is a perfect example of the film pushing ahead for universe building while sacrificing any real sense of long-term storytelling. We've never met this version of Harry Osborn before, but we're told he's got a connection to Peter going back years. We haven't seen the toll his genetic illness is taking on him, but we're told it's bad and we should care. We haven't seen any real development in terms of Green Goblin tech, but we're shown it all packaged and ready for Harry to dive in. It's a whole lot of telling without any emotional weight. This lack of real investment makes this the most forgettable version of Green Goblin on the big screen so far. Making Electro the primary villain of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was a good idea on paper. He's got cool powers that can manifest themselves in interesting ways visually, and he was played by Jamie Foxx, who offered up a new version of the character. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work. Fox seemed to do the best he could with the material he had, but the character's motivations get lost in the shuffle of everything else the film is trying to do. By the time Electro is somehow actually playing music with his powers at the end of the film, he's lost any goodwill he had before. I hate this song! Venom is a complicated character, and introducing him into any film as a Spider-Man antagonist has the potential to be very tricky business. The way Spider-Man 3 does it works fine as a catalyst for the film's climax, but doesn't really let audiences get to know this particular version of the villain and how he works. There's no time to dig into what the relationship to the symbiote is, or exactly why Eddie Brock gives in so quickly, or if there's any real humanity left in him. This version of Venom is pretty much just a fight scene, and that's a shame. Spider-Man Homecoming, the first solo Spider-Man adventure in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is a great example of a film that knows how to juggle multiple villains without overwhelming the piece. While Vulture does the heavy lifting as the film's chief bad guy, his crew back at headquarters fits into the story in an organic and entertaining way. However, the Tinkerer doesn't rank higher on this list because he doesn't have that much to do in the film. He's the guy in the chair, manipulating tech and communications behind the scenes while the Vulture does the fighting. Because of that, he's not a heavy hitter within the film, but he's certainly entertaining in the space he's given. 
Homecoming manages to breathe real life into him by making him a nosy, strange guy who's just happy to have a gig where he can be a huge tech nerd. What did I tell you about looking at my phone? Oh, sorry, you left it out. You know I'm a curious person by nature. The economy of storytelling in Homecoming is so great that the film manages to fit in not one, but two versions of the Shocker. In the film, he's an employee of the Vulture who's gifted with gauntlets that emit tremendous energy when they make contact with someone or something. It's enough to make the character stand out in his few fight scenes. The first Shocker relishes the idea that he can have a self-given code name and go around punching things with his new toys. You're up there wearing that goofy thing lighting up cars, calling yourself the Shocker. I'm the Shocker. I shock people. What is this, pro wrestling? Eh, whatever, old man. When the second Shocker gets a hold of the gauntlets, things become much more businesslike, and the deliberate, calculated way in which he tries to pick apart Peter Parker is actually rather chilling. Together, they present a portrait of a minor supervillain that adds plenty to the film while never getting in the way of Vulture's spotlight. The Amazing Spider-Man wisely started its new Spidey universe by picking a villain who'd only been hinted at in the Sam Raimi films in the form of a supporting character. We'd seen Dr. Kirk Connors before, but we'd never seen him transformed into a monster by his own scientific hubris and desperation. The fact that the character was in the Raimi films created a sense of excitement among fans who were finally going to get to see the lizard, while never quite feeling like the new film was retracing the steps of the old ones. In The Amazing Spider-Man, Dr. Connors takes on a certain kind of quiet strangeness that permeates the early scenes. You get the sense that he's a man who's thought far too much about things he probably shouldn't be tinkering with. As his slow transformation begins, the character becomes even stranger, creating a villain who's both threatening and sympathetic. The decision to make the Sandman a major villain in Spider-Man 3 is an interesting one, particularly when you consider all the other things the film is trying to do with Peter Parker's emotional journey. The decision to make him the guy who killed Uncle Ben off-screen in the first film complicates this in ways that neither the film nor the Spider-Man mythos really need. Despite this, this version of the Sandman works because of the parallels the film draws between him and Peter. They're both men with strange powers they didn't ask for, pushed into darkness by circumstances beyond their control, and hoping to atone for their past mistakes. Thomas Hayden Church plays the character with real heart, and his final scene is one of the most powerful moments in a flawed film. I'm not asking you to forgive me. I just want you to understand. Spider-Man 3 could have been a film entirely about the rise of a second Green Goblin in parallel to Peter Parker wrestling with the Venom symbiote, and it would have still been a jam-packed movie. As it is, we got a film that attempted to juggle three different villains and cram them all together into a final fight scene, so Harry Osborn's final journey in the Spider-Man trilogy gets crammed in too. Still, Harry's decision to become the second Green Goblin in an effort to avenge his father and then to seek heroic redemption is a rewarding one. It doesn't always work, particularly when Harry has to turn on a dime between hero and villain in various scenes, but the two preceding films add emotional weight to a weaker script. Willem Dafoe is having so much fun in the role of Green Goblin, years before character actors would begin competing for supervillain roles left and right, that his sense of instant joy at being immersed in the comic book world is infectious. Dafoe has to transform into full supervillain mode almost instantly, and somehow he brings it to life flawlessly. What do you want? To say what you won't. To do what you can't. He does so even in spite of the film's shortcomings and its treatment of the character, something that's particularly obvious in the costume design. The decision to forego an expressive face for the character and instead feature a fang-bearing mask might have made sense in 2002. Unfortunately, watching the film today, it makes the scenes with Spider-Man and the Goblin look a bit too much like action figures yelling at each other. Even in those moments, though, Defoe's voice carries the performance. If you didn't watch the intro, this is where the big spoilers happen, so turn back now. Spider-Man Far From Home had to follow a lot of different very tough acts, just one of which was Michael Keaton's performance as the Vulture. The decision to make the next villain Mysterio, another newcomer to live-action Spider-Man, was a welcome one. Even better, fans seem to immediately support Jake Gyllenhaal's casting as Mysterio, a guy who creates illusions to disguise his true intentions. Gyllenhaal gets a lot of meaty stuff to play with in the film, from the idea that he first presents himself as a hero from another dimension, to the revelation that he's a scorned former employee of Tony Stark. The early, more heroic scenes work great, but the turn is where Gyllenhaal really shines. Once the gloves are off and he's in full supervillain mode, he's having the time of his life, and so are we. 
He doesn't quite rise to the heights of the very best live-action Spider-Man villains, but he's very close. So much so that even after Far From Home, you can't help but feel hungry for more of him. With a few notable exceptions, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man films are often defined by their aesthetic and structural devotion to the Marvel Comics book they're based on. The key to the best of these films is the way in which they know exactly how to deviate and when. With Spider-Man 2, we get the best of both worlds in Dr. Octopus. He's a guy who looks and moves exactly how we'd expect the comic book version to move, and he has the added gravitas of a good man corrupted by his own creation. Alfred Molina is flawless as Dr. Octo Octavius, a scientist who's hoping to change the world before his brain is infected by the artificial intelligence in his robotic extra arms after a horrible accident. Riddled with guilt and grief, Molina plays the disintegration of the character perfectly, then manages to guide him back to redemption with the same sense of vulnerability and delicate emotional resonance. It's a great performance in a great comic book movie. Sometimes, Spider-Man stories are at their very best when they take a very simple, easy-to-follow metaphor and translate it into the big, bold strokes of a superhero story. Spider-Man Homecoming is a story about Peter Parker finding out his girlfriend's dad is a jerk, and the jerk is played to perfection by Michael Keaton. There's so much to love about the Vulture in Homecoming, from the look of the character to the way Keaton plays him as a working-class guy who got tired of being pushed around. There's no nonsense here, but there are tricky emotional turns to make, and Keaton manages them all by being equal parts charming and terrifying. The scene in which he has a private moment with Peter in his car is among the best moments in any Spider-Man film. Hey, I just saved your life. No, what do you say? Thank you. Even better, the fact that his character actually has a point about the way regular people are pushed down in an increasingly strange world only adds to his impact. It's a brilliant, layered performance that's going to be hard to top. There's nothing quite like a good shock at the movies, and while everyone loves to see their heroes live happily ever after, sometimes audiences need a reminder that life isn't all sunshine and roses. Here are a few movies where the villain actually wins. The Star Wars universe is no stranger to a villainous victory or two, with warring space factions trading constant blows back and forth across various conflicts. Rogue One and Revenge of the Sith certainly end on some downloads, for example. But the series' most iconic dark side victory came in the middle chapter of the original trilogy. Following the first film, which left off on a Death Star destroying High, The Empire Strikes Back came crashing back down to reality when it opened with the crushing defeat of the rebel forces on Hoth. While the movie splinters at that point, with various characters heading off to do their own thing, Thing, the paths of the protagonists ultimately lead back to Lando Calrissian's floating heaven of Cloud City. Unfortunately, when Darth Vader and his minions show up to Calrissian City, things quickly go south for pretty much everyone. Han Solo is tortured and used as a test subject for carbon freezing, leaving him in suspended animation. Calrissian loses Cloud City to the Empire. Meanwhile, Luke is lured into a trap and confronted with one of cinema's greatest ever twists. Needless to say, there's no doubt that Empire's final act is a home run for Vader and the Empire from start to finish. The 2008 film Valkyrie is inspired by the failed assassination attempt made against Adolf Hitler in the summer of 1944 by a cabal of German officers aiming to overthrow the Nazi regime. Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg joins Major General Henning von Tresco and a member of other conspirators who set up a plan to kill off the dictator and use the reserve army to maintain order and establish themselves as the new government. From there, they plan to use their power to negotiate favorable peace terms with the Allies, who at that point are on the clear path to victory. The film follows the story just as it actually unfolded, with everything seeming to move towards victory for von Stauffenberg and his co-conspirators. In fact, the movie does it so well, it almost makes you forget that you already know what's about to go down. But alas, Valkyrie is ruthlessly tethered to reality. Initially, the assassination comes tantalizingly close to success, with the planted explosives going off successfully and Operation Valkyrie being put into action. But before long, reports surface that Hitler survived the explosion. And from there, the whole plot collapses. The movie ends with Hitler still alive and the film's heroes executed for treason, which is about as bad as things possibly could have gone. Over the years, Marvel Comics have seen plenty of tragic endings and grisly cliffhangers, but the MCU itself has tended to prefer the good guys to come out on top. But this trend has recently begun to change, having kicked off in earnest when Captain America Civil War pitted the Avengers against one another, leaving a host of angry, PTSD-ridden superheroes behind in the process. This slide downhill only sped up with Thor Ragnarok, an otherwise fun movie that ended with Asgard destroyed and a small handful of survivors setting out in search of a new home. But it was only during Avengers Infinity War that Marvel 
Marvel finally opened up a universe in which the villains really can win. The colossal crossover event finds the hero struggling to rise up and defend the universe against Thanos and his cronies, only for the Mad Titan to finally pull off his cataclysmic finger snap and wipe out half the universe in the process. I am inevitable. While much of Thanos' mad destruction was undone in Avengers Endgame, Infinity War was nonetheless so focused on Thanos and his story that his victory during the film's closing moments was never anything but inevitable. Seven follows detectives William Somerset and David Mills as they investigate a series of murders by a mysterious criminal who uses the seven deadly sins as his calling card. The movie gains speed as the duo uncover the first five sins, but before the last two take place, the murderer, known as John Doe, turns himself into the authorities while covered in the blood of an unknown victim. As the movie wraps up, the growing sense of impending doom becomes practically unbearable. Doe directs Mills and Somerset to the desert, where he informs them that the last two victims will be found. Of course, they're already present as Doe confesses to being envious of Mills' idyllic life with his pregnant wife Tracy, before a box arrives on the scene, containing Tracy's head inside. Mills then gives in to temptation and kills Doe, who becomes the final victim of wrath. Aside from being messed up in so many ways, Seven's plot is never in the hands of the movie's protagonists, with Doe in total control right up until the credits roll. Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight delivered more than just an outstanding performance from a greatly missed actor, since Heath Ledger's Joker was also one of the first superhero villains to have his way with the hero from beginning to end. From the moment he enters that dramatic opening high sequence to his last laugh during the film's climax, the infamous DC villain easily steals the show. The Dark Knight revolves almost entirely around the Joker's schemes against Gotham and Batman, many of which are pulled off without a hitch. As a result, this second film in Nolan's epic trilogy leaves Rachel Dawes dead. Harvey Dent warped into two films and killed soon after, Batman on the run after taking responsibility for Dent's crimes, and the bat signal destroyed by Commissioner Gordon. See, madness, as you know, is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. <laughs> and sure, the Joker is eventually apprehended and has his nihilistic philosophy thoroughly disproven by the people of Gotham at the same time, but everything else went off about as well as he could have hoped. Christopher Nolan appears to have something of a gift for letting the villains win. In this case, you've got Memento. The narrative follows Leonard Shelby, a man who suffers from memory loss every five minutes. This is a recent affliction that has been occurring ever since two men assaulted and murdered his wife. After Shelby killed one of them, the other knocked him on the head and escaped, leaving him with his new mental handicap. Shelby is dead set on hunting down the other man responsible for his wife's death, but plagued with short-term memory loss, he is forced to use tattoos and Polaroid cameras in an elaborate system to remind himself of what he discovers. The movie is filmed in both color and black and white sequences, showing different angles of perception and giving a sense of bizarre confusion that helps the audiences relate to the the film's hero. Except Shelby isn't the hero. As the movie concludes, we find that he has been cyclically hunting down and taking vengeance on innocent people for a year. Repressing this information, Shelby tampers with his own photographic evidence, allowing his condition to wash all guilt away within the next few minutes and permitting him to continue his villainous behavior. While Peter Jackson's film adaptation of J.R.R. Tolkien's or inspiring Lord of the Rings trilogy has many happy moments during its runtime, the ending of the first film, The Fellowship of the Ring, isn't one of them. As the film reaches its crescendo, the Fellowship has already gone through the devastating loss of Gandalf. But things go from bad to worse as the forces of Mordor close in on them. Boromir kicks things off by falling to the lore of the Ring and attempting to take it from Frodo. Unsuccessful and repentant, Boromir and the rest of the heroes turn their attention to a sudden attack of Orahai soldiers sent by Sauron man to find the ring. The attack splits the group up, with the villains killing Boromir and successfully carrying off the hobbits Merry and Pippin. Frodo, meanwhile, leaves with Sam across the river, and the two begin to work their way towards Mordor alone. All in all, this ending is about as chaotic as it gets, and doesn't lead to any one of the protagonists actually getting their way. Though Triumph lies ahead, the truth is that Fellowship is a movie about the power of camaraderie. That, nonetheless, tears its characters away from each other during its final moments, and that's about as bleak as it gets. Though it's outside the canon of the MCU and doesn't have quite as catastrophic an ending as Infinity War, X-Men First Class is another Marvel movie that doesn't reward its heroes with a happy ending. In this prequel to the original X-Men movies, the storyline jumps back in time to the 1960s to explore the origin stories of its heroes and villains. In particular, the film focuses on the development of the relationship between Professor Charles Xavier and Eric Lencher, which is the story of a profound and meaningful friendship right up until it isn't. We have it in us to be the better men. We already are. 
We're the next stage of human evolution. You said it yourself. No, no. While the movie itself brought a fresh spin to a flagging franchise, its story ended on a dark note with the rise of an iconic Marvel villain, Magneto. As the film enters its final act, the differences between Xavier's and Lencher's views on mutant activism come to a head, with Lencher dramatically parting ways with a critically wounded Xavier and his team. This sets him on a journey towards becoming the franchise's most notable villain, and begins a rivalry fated to go down in history. Like Valkyrie, Life is Beautiful is another story that ends with the Nazis coming out on top. This classic Italian film was directed and co-written by the incredibly talented Roberto Benigni, who also played the lead role alongside Nicoletti Braschi, his wife of nearly 30 years. The first half of the film is almost entirely light and comedic, as it follows Guido, a Jewish bookshop owner in Italy who shamelessly pursues the love of his life with a little slapstick clowning and a lot of Italian charm. But things take a drastic turn when the narrative jumps forward several years to a Nazi-occupied Italy, where Guido, his wife, and their son are sent to a concentration camp. Once in the camp, the bookshop owner uses his incredibly resilient imagination to tirelessly shield his son from the horrors around them, convincing the young boy that they're on a strange kind of holiday. Despite the subject matter, the movie does actually build toward a happy ending, until in a gut-wrenching turn, Guido is gunned down by Nazis just as the camp is liberated. And while Guido's son's innocence is preserved, the loss of the film's lovable protagonist is nonetheless a shocking note for the film to end on. Just like the classic 1949 George Orwell novel on which it's based, the movie 1984 is about as depressing as it gets. From the infamous thought police to the near-endless torture, brainwashing, and double-think, this movie pretty much established all the classic tropes of futuristic dystopian horror. The film is set in a world where a single united superstate of Oceania is run like a well-oiled autocratic machine, in which every move and thought of its inhabitants is scrutinized for any deviation from government-approved behavior. The story follows Winston Smith, a supposed loyal worker at the Ministry of Truth. Smith deviates from the rules when he meets Julia and begins to secretly pursue an affair with a daring fellow thought criminal. Of course, government forces prove much more powerful than two people, and the end of the movie shows the couple as they're caught and put through a system of rehabilitation in which they are tortured and forced to face their greatest fears in order to break their rebellion and ensure their future cooperation with the regime. And that heartbreaking ending in the cafe, in which Julia and Winston coldly admit they betrayed each other, leaves no doubt whatsoever that Big brother has come out on top. Spider-Man has faced nearly every member of his rogues gallery during his cinematic adventures, but there are still a few villains who have yet to make their silver screen debut. From killer goblins to monstrous vampires to, um, swarms of bees, these are a few of those villains. Kraven the Hunter is by far the most infamous Spider-Man villain to have never featured in a live-action movie. Otherwise known as Sergei Kravenov, this obsessive big-game hunter first appeared all the way back in 1964's Amazing Spider-Man Vol. 1, No. 15. In this story, Kraven is hired by his friend Chameleon to bring down Spider-Man. Inevitably, the hunter quickly becomes the prey, and Spider-Man has Kraven both arrested and deported. This would mark the beginning of a long and storied criminal career for Sergei Kravenov, who has devoted his entire existence to besting Spider-Man once and for all. Considering Kraven is such a prominent member of Spider-Man's rogues gallery, it'll come as no surprise to find that fans have been clamoring for him to show up on screen for many years. And he's come pretty close, too. In 2021, Tom Holland even told Collider that Spider-Man No Way Home director John Watts originally intended for the third MCU Spidey movie to feature Kraven as the main antagonist. And now, it seems that Kraven is finally about to step into the spotlight. A solo film set within Sony's Spider-Man universe has been on the cards for a while now, and in 2021, Deadline reported that Avengers Age of Ultron star Aaron Taylor-Johnson had been cast as the notorious Hunter himself. You didn't see that coming? Should all go to plan, Kraven the Hunter will land in theaters on January 13, 2023. Goblin villains will be very familiar to fans of the Spider-Man movies. Willem Dafoe made comic book movie history as Norman Osborn's Green Goblin in the original Spider-Man, while James Franco played Harry Osborn in Sam Raimi's trilogy, taking the mantle of New Goblin in Spider-Man 3. Similarly, Dane DeHaan played a goblin-crazed Harry Osborn in The Amazing Spider-Man 2. In the comics, however, there are far more goblins than the Green Goblin, and many more people have taken the mantle than Norman and Harry Osborn. Perhaps the second most well-known of these is the villain known as the Hobgoblin. Six people have operated under that name over the years, but the deadliest of all is Roderick Kingsley. Debuting as the masked villain in 1983's Amazing Spider-Man Vol. 1, No. 238, 
Kingsley is a billionaire fashion designer who enters the criminal underworld after acquiring and altering Norman Osborne's goblin formula. It's probably fair to say that audiences are probably over the Green Goblin by now, despite Willem Dafoe's dramatic return in Spider-Man No Way Home. Nevertheless, the Hobgoblin's movie debut could provide a refreshing twist on a fan-favorite villain. Otherwise known as The Spot, Jonathan Owen first appeared in 1985's Peter Parker, The Spectacular Spider-Man Vol. 1, No. 98. A scientist in the employ of Kingpin, Owen creates a strange black portal while attempting to recreate the powers of the vigilante hero, Cloak. It soon becomes clear that Owen has gained the ability to open these portals and traverse physical space via the so-called Spot World. Owen subsequently names himself The Spot and embarks upon a criminal career. The Spot's unique costume and strange abilities make him a more visually arresting villain than most. Suitably, he's featured in a number of stories beyond the comic book universe, including Spider-Man the Animated Series and the 2017 Spider-Man show. It's possible he'll be popping up on the silver screen sometime soon, too, as, according to Murphy's Multiverse, The Spot could be a key baddie in the upcoming animated sequel, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. This could literally not get any weirder. Since the comic book version of Own is a close ally of Kingpin, who was the main antagonist in Into the Spider-Verse, it's easy to see how he might fit into Miles Morales' story and how the Spot's interdimensional powers could provide an intriguing slant on the original movie's multiversal antics. The Inheritors are a team of supervillains best known for their role in the original Spider-Verse story arc and its follow-up, Spider-Geddon. Each member of this clan of totem-hunting vampires has dedicated their life to hunting down spider people across the multiverse and consuming their essences. A number of Inheritors have battled Spider-Man and his other selves, but the two most prominent are Morlin and Karn. Morlin is arguably the deadliest and scariest member of the Inheritors, having killed and consumed a whole heap of spider people during his so-called Great Hunt. Karn, meanwhile, is living in exile during his first appearance. After he hesitated on a mission to capture the Master Weaver, who controls the all-powerful web of life and destiny, Karn's mother was struck down and killed. As a result, Karn was exiled until he could prove his return, a task he attempts to accomplish throughout the first Spider-Verse storyline. As the main antagonists of the comic book version of Spider-Verse, it seems strange that the Inheritors had nothing to do with Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Still, with two follow-ups planned for that movie, who knows what the future has in store for these dimension-hopping ghouls. Silver Sable is one of those Spider-Man characters who can act as an ally or an enemy of the wall crawler, depending on what each story requires. Born Sylvia Sablinova, this highly skilled mercenary was introduced in 1985's Amazing Spider-Man Vol. 1, No. 265, in which she leads the vigilante team of soldiers known as the Wild Pack. Although she has collaborated with a number of superheroes over the years, including Spider-Man, Silver Sable has still played the role of antagonist every now and then. Although Sablinova has yet to star in a Spider-Man movie, the character was once destined for the big screen. In 2017, Sony announced that production had begun on Silver and Black, a feature film following the adventures of Sable and Black Cat, another morally ambiguous Spider-Man friend and foe. Sadly, the project wasn't destined to last, and director Gina Prince Bythewood eventually revealed that Sony were considering offering the story to Disney+, having previously decided to give each character their own movie project. A few months later, Prince Bythewood told Looper that she'd been preoccupied with her work on the Netflix movie The Old Guard, but that she was planning to re-engage with the Silver Sable and Black Cat project at some point. Still, Marvel fans shouldn't expect to see Sable gracing the silver screen in the near future. The villain known as Mr. Negative is a more recent addition to Spider-Man's rogues gallery, first hitting the page in 2007's Free Comic Book Day, The Amazing Spider-Man. His true name isn't known, but the man who became Mr. Negative was once a Chinese gangster, captured by the crime boss Silvermane and forced to undergo an experimental drug procedure. This process gave him control over the Light Force and Dark Force two forms of extra-dimensional energy that are more commonly wielded by mutants and magic users. The experiment also split the gangster's mind into two, forming the Martin Lee persona, a philanthropist who works with the homeless, as well as Mr. Negative himself, 
the evil crime lord at the head of the inner demon's street gang. Mr. Negative has played a prominent role in Spider-Man's stories in recent years, but one of his most famous occurs in the Marvel's Spider-Man video game, in which he wages a war against Kingpin and Norman Osborn for control of New York. What are you doing to me? Giving you a new perspective. Obviously, Mr. Negative isn't exactly a stalwart of the live-action Spider-Man movies, but his homeless charity, Feast, appears in Spider-Man No Way Home. So never say never. Despite being nowhere near as well-known as Spider-Man's A-list villains, the Jackal is actually one of Peter Parker's oldest foes. In 1965, The Amazing Spider-Man Vol. 1, No. 31 introduced readers to Miles Warren, a professor at Empire State University who develops a desperate infatuation with the student, Gwen Stacy. After Stacy is killed by the Green Goblin, Warren blames Spider-Man for her death adopting the Jackal alter ego in order to get his revenge. The Jackal's true identity was actually something of a twist in the original comic books. His villainous persona didn't emerge until 1974's The Amazing Spider-Man Vol. 1, No. 129, with his true identity revealed a year later in No. 148. In subsequent years, the Jackal has fought Spider-Man on a number of occasions, but his most notable contribution is the creation of clone copies of Spider-Man, such as Ben Reilly, who eventually became the Jackal himself. As such, the Jackal has taken on a starring role in some of Spider-Man's most famous and infamous storylines, including the Clone Saga and Spider-Island. Here's a pitch for you. An Australian with a knack for hurling boomerangs dons a goofy costume and turns to a life of crime, joining up with several supervillain teams in the process. Think you've heard this one before? Well, this isn't actually the origin of DC's Captain Boomerang, or at least it's not just the origin of DC's Captain Boomerang. This is the story of Frederick Myers, aka Boomerang. DC's take on a boomerang-wielding criminal preceded Marvel's by six years, with the latter hitting the scene in 1966's Tales to Astonish Vol. 1, No. 81. And it's also probably fair to say that Marvel's boomerang is far less renowned than his distinguished competitor. Myers is an ex-professional baseball player, known for his strong pitching arm, who was drafted into the employ of the Hydra-adjacent group known as the Secret Empire. His new taskmasters outfitted him with special weapons and conferred upon him the codename Boomerang, more as a joke than anything else. After the end of the Empire, Myers decides to become a freelance assassin and in this role, he has joined the ranks of pretty much every team of supervillains to have ever existed. Sadly, considering DC's Captain Boomerang has recently been adapted into live action for both Suicide Squad movies, it doesn't seem likely that Marvel will be trying out their own Boomerang anytime soon. Let's just get one thing clear here. Yes, this is absolutely a man made of bees. Better known under the pseudonym Swarm, Fritz von Meyer was a Nazi scientist who stumbled across a colony of mutant bees after the end of World War II. Von Meyer attempted and failed to control these bees, who consumed him alive and absorbed him into their hive mind. This not only merged their consciousnesses, but also gave him the ability to control them at will. All of this is explained in Champions Volume 1, No. 15, a story in which Swarm takes on a team of heroes including Angel, Black Widow, Ghost Rider, Hercules, Iceman, and Darkstar. Since then, however, Von Meyer and his bothersome bees have become a stalwart enemy of Spider-Man. More recently, in Ant-Man Volume 2, he has teamed up with Scott Lang to take down the Bug Lords, who are exactly what they sound like. As you might have guessed, Swarm isn't exactly the most serious comic book villain out there. Indeed, his latest stories have been a lot of fun, often leaning into the character's arch silliness. If ever a future Spider-Man movie needed a colorful and amusing secondary antagonist to stir up trouble on the side, Swarm would be just the horrific mass of bees for the job. Jackson Wheel, aka Big Wheel, is one of Spider-Man's weirdest foes. First appearing in 1978's The Amazing Spider-Man Vol. 1, No. 182, Wheel is a corrupt businessman who hires the villainous engineer known as the Tinkerer to create a massive, deadly monowheel that will help him to defeat his rival, Rocket Racer. Their feud soon brings the big wheel into the path of Spider-Man, sparking a rivalry that would last, well, not very long at all. Wheel actually disappears at the end of the very next issue and has only returned a few times, mostly as a joke character. He has also dabbled in superheroics every now and again, and even his more recent acts of mischief have been half-hearted at best. 
Big Wheel has yet to turn up in a live-action adaptation of Spider-Man's Adventures, which you probably knew already, because who wouldn't have remembered Andrew Garfield fleeing a huge wheel in The Amazing Spider-Man 2? Still, it's probably fair to say that this guy needs to join the MCU ASAP. Cast some highly prestigious A-list actor, throw him into battle against Peter Parker, and watch those box office numbers soar. James Bond wouldn't be half the spy he is if he didn't have some killer villains to square off against. Since 1962, he's been facing down some of the toughest bad guys in movie history. We're here to give you a glimpse of what they look like today. From Le Chiffre to Hugo Drax. In the 25th Bond film No Time to Die, the villainous and mysterious Safin will be played by Rami Malek. Malek is best known for playing protagonist Elliot Alderson in the television series Mr. Robot and Freddie Mercury in the film Bohemian Rhapsody. He's been active since the early 2000s, playing small roles in shows like 24 and Gilmore Girls and films like Night at the Museum. Mr. Robot was the launch pad he needed. And it appears Malik will only continue to climb higher in Hollywood. Christoph Waltz's breakout role arrived in 2009 when he blew audiences away as SS officer Hans Landa in Quentin Tarantino's and Glorious Bastards. Waltz went on to secure major roles in movies like Django Unchained and eventually 2015's Spectre. Waltz is the latest actor to play Ernst Stavro Blofeld, a recurring Bond villain played officially by five different actors over six decades. In this continuity, Blofeld is actually Bond's adoptive brother, who believes Bond supplanted his position as favored son. Blofeld is the head of the global criminal organization Spectre, which is secretly responsible for the events of the previous three films. You killed him. Yes, I did. Vaults has continued to act since Spectre, having appeared in a wide variety of films including Alita, Battle Angel, The Legend of Tarzan, and Downsizing. Vaults will reprise his role as Blofeld in 2020's Bond installment, No Time to Die. Javier Bardem's first work as an actor happened early. He began acting as a child in 1974 and went on to appear in many movies throughout the 1990s and 2000s, culminating in his star-making turn as psychopathic killer Anton Sugar in 2007's No Country for Old Men. This led to bigger roles, including Raul Silva in the 2012 Bond film Skyfall. Silva is a former MI6 agent who was brutally tortured after M traded him to the Chinese government in return for six captured agents. Skyfall sees him become a cyber terrorist, out for bloody revenge on M. Following Skyfall, Bardem has continued acting, most prominently playing the mysterious male lead in Darren Aronofsky's Mother and Armando Salazar in Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. Matthew Amalric started acting in 1984's Favorites of the Moon, and his most notable performances pre-Bond are his roles in The Diving Bell and The Butterfly and Munich. In 2008, Amalric made his Bond debut as the villainous Dominic Green in Quantum of Solace. Green is an environmentalist entrepreneur who secretly works for the mysterious organization known as Quantum. This evil collective is buying up Bolivia's supply of fresh water, creating a monopoly that will make Green exponentially richer at the expense of the Bolivian people. Amalric has remained very active as an actor, appearing in movies like Venus and Fur and shows like Wolf Hall, among many other credits. Mass Mikkelsen enjoyed worldwide recognition for his role as Le Chiffre in Casino Royale. A mathematical genius, Le Chiffre finances various terrorist groups, but ultimately loses their money in risky investments. This forces him to set up a high-stakes poker game in an effort to compensate for his losses. Bond enters the game, hoping to prevent Le Chiffre from paying back his debtors and force him into seeking protection from MI6. Mikkelsen's acting career exploded in the wake of Casino Royale. The years since have seen him take on high-profile roles such as Cassilius in Doctor Strange and Dr. Hannibal Lecter in the celebrated television series Hannibal. Stevens has enjoyed a robust career in acting since 1992, including performances in Twelfth Night and the title role in the 2000 TV movie adaptation of The Great Gatsby. He assumed the role of Bond antagonist in Die Another Day as Gustave Graves, a British billionaire with a dark secret. Stevens has remained very active since Die Another Day. Most notably, he starred as Captain Flint in Black Sails, 
and as John Robinson in the 2018 reimagining of Lost in Space. Scottish actor Robert Carlyle started acting in the 1990s, taking on roles in films like Train Spotting and The Full Monty. In 1999, he faced James Bond as the villainous Reynard in The World Is Not Enough. Reynard previously survived an assassination attempt by MI6, but it left a bullet in his brain. Now, he seeks revenge against MI6 by any means necessary. Since his turn in The World Is Not Enough, Carlyle has taken on a variety of notable roles in film and television. He appeared as Dr. Nicholas Rush in Stargate Universe, portrayed Rumpelstiltskin in Once Upon a Time, and took on the role of Prime Minister Robert Sutherland on the television series Cobra. Welsh actor Jonathan Price started his career on the British stage of the 1970s and later moved to film with projects like Brazil. In 1997, Price played the Bond villain Elliot Carver in Tomorrow Never Dies. Carver is a sociopathic media baron who plans to expand his empire by inciting a war between China and the UK. Price has enjoyed a number of stellar roles since Tomorrow Never Dies. He's earned particular acclaim for his performances as Pope Francis in The Two Popes, Weatherby Swan in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, and The High Sparrow in Game of Thrones. Before playing a Bond villain, Bean performed Shakespeare on stage and earned roles in films like Patriot Games and Black Beauty. In 1995, he took on the role of Alec Trevelyan, a fellow MI6 agent and close friend to James Bond in GoldenEye. The two conduct a mission together in which Trevelyan is seemingly killed, but nine years later, it's revealed that he staged his death and betrayed MI6 to become a crime lord. Bean has continued to have a very successful career, landing roles in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, National Treasure, and Game of Thrones. Robert Davi has enjoyed a rich acting career since the 1970s, appearing in such classics as The Goonies and Die Hard. In 1989, he starred as international drug lord Franz Sanchez in License to Kill. Sanchez's master plan is quite simple, really. He wants to continue to sell drugs on a massive scale and corrupt or kill anyone who gets in the way. After playing a Bond villain, Davi has continued acting in a wide variety of projects, including Predator 2, Stargate, Atlantis, Criminal Minds, The Expendables 3, and more. Dutch actor Jeroen Krabbe began acting in the 1960s, enjoying particular distinction from his work in Soldier of Orange and The Fourth Man. The late 80s saw him play a string of villainous roles which brought him widespread acclaim. Most prominently, General Koskov in the 1987 Bond film The Living Daylights. Koskov is a brilliant Soviet general who feigns neutrality in the Cold War. In reality, he plans to misuse Soviet funds to buy a large supply of opium and trade it for arms. Krabbe went on to play many more famous villains, including Gianni Franco in The Punisher, Charles Nichols in The Fugitive, and even Satan himself in the 1999 TV movie Jesus. He continues to act and is also an accomplished painter. Joe Don Baker started his acting career with parts in westerns like Wild Rovers going on to earn major attention for his roles in Charlie Varick and Walking Tall. In 1987, Baker played the war-obsessed arms dealer Brad Whitaker in The Living Daylights. Baker has continued to act in the years following The Living Daylights, though the last decade did see him grow considerably less active. Before this slowdown, Baker appeared in movies like Congo and even returned to the Bond franchise. He played the very different role of Bond's ally Jack Wade in Goldeneye and Tomorrow Never Dies. Prior to taking on Bond, Christopher Walken earned acclaim for his roles in classics like Annie Hall, The Deer Hunter, and The Dead Zone. In A View to a Kill, he played tech giant Max Zorin, who planned to destroy Silicon Valley to eliminate competition for his microchip business. After playing Max Zorin, Walken has maintained a very active career. He's appeared in Batman Returns, Pulp Fiction, Ants, Sleepy Hollow, Catch Me If You Can, and many other notable films. Walken is also a frequent host of Saturday Night Live, where you likely best know him for being in an unforgettable sketch with an unforgettable line. Guess what? I got a fever. And the only prescription is more cowbell. Julian Glover has been acting since the 1950s, taking on a wide variety of roles in productions including The Empire Strikes Back, Quatermass and the Pit, and The Avengers. In 1981, Glover found himself face to face with James Bond as the villain Aristotle Christatos in For Your Eyes Only. 
Christatos appears to be a respectable war hero and businessman, but is later revealed to be a heroin smuggler and double agent. After playing a Bond villain, Glover has continued to have a very successful acting career. Most prominently, Glover played Walter Donovan in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, voiced Aragog in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and portrayed Grand Maester Pycelle in Game of Thrones. Michael Lonsdale has appeared in over 180 different films and television shows. However, his most famous role is likely still Bond villain Hugo Drax, from the 1979 film Moonraker. Drax is an extremely wealthy businessman who owns a company that builds space shuttles. Being rich and powerful has clearly gone to Drax's head, as he wants to wipe out humanity and restart society with a few selected humans. Using his spacecraft, he and his master race plan to orbit the planet until toxins kill everyone below. Lonsdale continued to enjoy a rich acting career post-Drax. Notably, he won a César Award for his performance as Luke in the 2010 film of Gods and Men and remained active on screen until 2016. He passed away in September of 2020. French actor Louis Jordan gained major acclaim for playing suave roles in French and American films, working closely with big names like Alfred Hitchcock and Elizabeth Taylor. In 1983, Jordan played the villainous Kamal Khan in Octopussy. Khan, an exiled Afghan prince, starts out as a jewelry smuggler whose plans get bigger and deadlier when he helps smuggle an atomic bomb into West Germany. After playing a Bond villain, Jordan continued acting in film and television until his retirement in 1992. In 2015, Jordan passed away at the age of 93. Richard Keel played henchman Jaws in The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. Jaws is extremely strong and tall, forcing Bond into creative approaches when fighting him. His most striking feature, however, are his metal teeth, which can bite through even the hardest metals. In an interesting plot twist, Jaws ends up undergoing a major change of heart, turning on his boss and helping Bond defeat Drax. Jaws even gets a girlfriend in the end. Well, here's to us. Keel continued acting after playing Jaws, appearing in roles like Mr. Larson and Happy Gilmore. He passed away in 2014 at the age of 74. Kurt Jurgen's filmography is extensive. Before his Bond days, he starred in films like The Enemy Below and The Longest Day. Then, in 1977, Jurgen's took up the Bond villain mantle in The Spy Who Loved Me, playing the ocean-obsessed Carl Stromberg, who plans to start a nuclear war and start a new life for humanity at sea. Jurgen's continued acting after his role in The Spy Who Loved Me with roles in the sci-fi sports drama Golden Girl and the war film Breakthrough. His last role was General Vladimir in the BBC miniseries Smiley's People. He passed away in 1982 at the age of 66. It's no surprise that the late Christopher Lee played a Bond villain. His impressive acting career contains many villainous roles, from Saruman in the Lord of the Rings series to Count Dracula in the Hammer horror films. In 1974, Lee took on the role of Francisco Scaramanga in The Man with the Golden Gun. An infamous assassin with a famous weapon, Scaramanga also has a flying car and a secret island. To Scaramanga, it's not about eliminating Bond, it's about besting him. This is the part I really like. Lee remained very active as an actor leading up to his death in 2015 at the age of 93. In addition to his work in major franchises like The Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, in which he played Count Dooku, he also enjoyed a career as a heavy metal vocalist. Yafet Koto is the sinister Dr. Kananga in 1973's Live and Let Die. Simultaneously a dictator and a gangster, Kananga's plan is to freely distribute heroin at his restaurants, bankrupt his competitors, then raise his prices. Koto went on to enjoy more major success as an actor, including his role in the NBC television series Homicide – Life on the Street. He's also widely known as Parker in Alien and Alonzo Mosley in Midnight Run. Baron Samdi, played by Jeffrey Holder, is one of the most frightening bad guys in the Bond franchise. Appearing in 1973's Live and Let Die, he's a witch doctor of the fictional Caribbean island of San Monique, who works for the main villain, Dr. Kananga. Outside of Bond, Holder enjoyed a stellar career as an actor, dancer, musician, and artist on both stage and screen, with roles in films like Annie and Boomerang. Holder passed away in 2014 at the age of 84. 
English actor Charles Gray actually appeared in You Only Live Twice as a different Bond character. But in 1971, he returned to the franchise as the main villain, Ernst Stavro Blofeld in Diamonds Are Forever. This time, Blofeld has physically altered his henchmen to look like him. Bond must identify and stop the real Blofeld, who plans on using a satellite built out of diamonds to destroy the world's arsenals. Gray continued acting post-Blofeld, playing roles like the criminologist in the Rocky Horror Picture Show and Mycroft Holmes in the 1984 TV series Sherlock Holmes. He passed away in 2000 at the age of 71. Telly Savalas gained fame for roles in films like The Greatest Story Ever Told, The Dirty Dozen, and Birdman of Alcatraz. Then, in 1969, Savalas portrayed Ernst Stavro Blofeld in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Blofeld is threatening the world yet again in this movie, this time through biological warfare. He brainwashes women, putting them into a hypnotic state in which they distribute bacterial agents capable of devastating the world's agriculture. After Bond foils his plans, Blofeld kills Bond's wife Tracy, which furthers the feud between the two epic rivals. Savalas continued to play big roles post-Blofeld, including starring in the popular television series Kojak. Savalas remained active as an actor right up until his death in 1994, at the age of 72. In You Only Live Twice, Ernst Stavro Blofeld is portrayed by British actor Donald Pleasance, who ended up creating one of the most recognizable villains in the entire Bond series. His Blofeld has a secret base hidden inside a volcano, where he dispatches orders with his white cat in his lap. After bringing Blofeld to life, Pleasance remained very active as an actor, playing notable roles in the Halloween franchise, Prince of Darkness, and more. In 1995, Pleasance passed away at the age of 75. Adolfo Celli specialized in playing villains with a cosmopolitan edge. It's no surprise, then, that he played Emilio Largo in Thunderball with such panache. Largo's evil plan is to steal warheads and blackmail NATO into paying him a large sum of money, lest he start destroying major cities. Shelley went on to act in numerous roles post-Largo, including The Borgias and Danger Diabolic, and continued acting right up until he passed away in 1986 at the age of 63. Gert Fruba played the title role of gold-obsessed madman Auric Goldfinger in Goldfinger, one of the quintessential Bond films. The film's plot features Goldfinger's attempt to rob Fort Knox in order to drive up the price of gold, and also includes one of the most famous lines in the franchise. No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die! After his turn as one of the most iconic Bond villains ever, Furuba continued to have a rich acting career on stage and screen. His roles in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and Those Magnificent Men and Their Flying Machines saw him gain particular acclaim in very different genres musical fantasy and comedy, respectively. He passed away in 1988 at the age of 75. Even though he isn't the main villain of the movie, Odd Job is one of the most memorable parts of Goldfinger. Played by Harold Sakata, his weapon of choice is his hat, which has a razor-sharp steel rim. Odd Job is terrifyingly good at assassinating victims by hurling his hat at high speed. Though Odd Job was Sakata's first role as an actor after a successful weightlifting career, it definitely wasn't his last. He went on to perform in productions like Hawaii Five-O, Impulse, and Dimension Five. Sakata occasionally spoofed his role as Odd Job in later years, most prominently by appearing in a series of Vicks cough syrup commercials. He passed away in 1982 at the age of 62. Lottie Lenya played Rosa Kleb, a high-ranking member of the mysterious Spectre organization in From Russia With Love. Kleb, one of the franchise's first villains, is remembered best for her signature weapon, poison-tipped blades concealed in the tips of her shoes. Lenya was already a respected actor pre-Bond thanks to an acclaimed stage career and roles in films like The Roman Spring of Mrs. Stone. She was also an accomplished singer and was inducted into the American Theater Hall of Fame in 1979. Two years later, in 1981, she passed away at the age of 83. Joseph Wiseman had the honor of playing the first Bond villain, Julius No, in 1962's Dr. No. Julius No has a killer outfit, a complex backstory, and an epic underground lair where he plots to start a war between the Russians and Americans. Like so many Bond villains who would follow him, No also has a unique physical trait, 
prosthetic metal hands. Wiseman continued to act after his turn as Dr. No, appearing in The Twilight Zone, Magnum P.I., MacGyver, and more. Wiseman passed away in 2009 at the age of 91. Even the MCU's strongest and most charismatic villains have weak spots of their own, through which the heroes wind up gaining the upper hand and saving the day. From Ironmonger to Killmonger, here are the biggest weaknesses of these MCU bad guys. The Marvel Cinematic Universe got its start in 2008 with Iron Man, which introduced the world to Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark and laid the groundwork for the next 10 years of genre-defining superhero movies. As iconic as the first Iron Man film is, however, we wouldn't blame you for forgetting about Obadiah Stane, the vicious opponent who inadvertently pushed Tony to transform from a brilliant but selfish arms dealer into a world-saving, self-sacrificing hero. Stane was an old friend of Howard Stark, Tony's father, and served as CEO of Stark Industries after Howard's death until Tony was able to take over. Despite his fatherly demeanor, Stane coveted Tony's role as the man in charge, and he wound up throwing in his lot with the Ten Rings in an effort to get Tony out of the picture and regain control of the company. Stane simply was not content to be Tony's mentor and second-in-command, especially when Tony's conscience started cutting into Stark Industries' bottom line. He hoped to seize back the company from its idealistic CEO, and he created the Ironmonger suit to help him do just that. Unfortunately for Stane, the greed that motivated him to steal a company was also what led to his ultimate demise. Not only did he pause to gloat rather than finishing Tony off, his rush to build his own Iron Man suit without Tony's brilliance backing it up left him with a powerful but crucially flawed design. How'd you solve the icing problem? Icing problem? Might want to look into it. That combination of arrogance and greed, along with an unfortunate choice to open up his armor to brag face to face, put a quick end to Stane's career as a supervillain. It's no secret that the children of Odin could use quite a bit of family therapy, although each of them seems to struggle with a different issue. The Allfather's youngest son, Loki, wrestles with a godly inferiority complex that pit him against his family and would come to threaten not just the world, but the entire universe. Even before he learned that he was actually the biological son of the frost giant King Laufey, Loki felt like he could never get out of his brother Thor's shadow. So I am no more than another stolen relic, locked up here until you might have use of me. Why'd you twist my words? After learning the truth of his origins, Loki's insecurity kicked into overdrive. He compensated by attempting to get rid of his brother entirely so that he wouldn't have to compete with him anymore, even though Thor himself never saw Loki as anything but a beloved brother. That anger even drove him to drop into the vast emptiness of space rather than accept his brother's mercy after his first defeat. When Loki returned in the Avengers, it was as a puppet of Thanos, throwing in with the universe's most evil villain in an effort to prove himself superior to his brother. Even then, the greatest opponent Loki faced was his own self-doubt. Well, self-doubt and the Hulk. Over and over, he attempted to prove that he was worthy of something he already had, the love and respect of his adopted family. At first, he acted out in unhealthy and harmful ways in an attempt to convince both his relatives and himself that he didn't need anything from them, even though he obviously yearned for their approval. Eventually, as he learned to accept that Thor had always loved him just the way he was, he was able to work productively alongside his brother, instead of feeling threatened by him. Just in time to be taken out by Thanos in front of the brother with whom he'd just made peace. Better late than never. As a literal robot, it's unsurprising that the genocidal Ultron adhered pretty stringently to rules of his own making. However, his inability to compromise or bend his rigid views is what ultimately led to his downfall in Avengers Age of Ultron. Well, that and the Hulk. These bad guys don't really do so well with him, huh? A product of Tony Stark's peacekeeping program, which was subsequently beefed up by the Mind Stone, Ultron's core objective was to protect the Earth from future threats. Unfortunately for everyone, after mulling over his mission for a while, Ultron determined that the biggest threat to Earth was, in fact, humans, and he set about attempting to eradicate them. The fixed mindset that sent Ultron on his destructive path was also what caused his end. Even after meeting opposition from the Vision, an artificial being created the same way, Ultron couldn't be reasoned with. If Ultron had been able to change his mind, perhaps the Avengers would have found a way to allow him to exist. As it was, Ultron's single-mindedness paved the way for his complete annihilation, just like all of his robotic creations. Superhero movies might be popular, but they tend to be a hard sell when it comes to critical acknowledgement. Every now and then, though, one manages to break through as an awards contender because it's simply too compelling to ignore. This was the case with Black Panther, and a big part of that film's success was thanks to its villain, Eric Killmonger. 
Unlike most Marvel movies, which tend to open with the hero's origin story, Black Panther started with Killmongers, and from the moment we saw him as a child in that opening scene, he was incredibly sympathetic. In fact, as the film progressed, the moviegoers in the audience and even some of the film's good guys had to admit that Killmonger was making a few good points. These items aren't for sale. How do you think your ancestors got these? You think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? T'Challa himself conceded that his father, T'Chaka, was wrong about Wakanda's policy of isolation and that abandoning young Eric had been a mistake. Yet, rather than cultivate the favor of the people already inclined to agree with him, Killmonger wound up pushing them away with his uncompromising extremist views, while adopting a more measured approach could have won him allies within Wakanda, including possibly even T'Challa. Killmonger's plan was to stoke civil uprisings by flooding the world with Wakandan weapons. His all-or-nothing approach to achieving his vision meant that rather than finding an ally in the King of Wakanda, he found an opponent, and the two wound up battling to the death. Loki spent his entire cinematic lifetime struggling to dig out from under a hefty pile of self-doubt and prove his worthiness to his father, his brother, and, most of all, himself. His older sister Hela had the opposite problem in Thor Ragnarok. She was so convinced that she should be ruling over Asgard that she thought all she'd have to do was show up and people would fall in line behind their beloved new queen. Granted, she was a formidable opponent, as evidenced by her ability to take out the Warriors Three and the armies of Asgard single-handedly. Still marching through the streets, taking out beloved second-string Marvel characters, and sending all the other Asgardians into hiding doesn't really endear you to the public, no matter how cool your giant wolf is. In other words, she wasn't exactly greeted as a liberator, and her entitlement lulled her into thinking she'd prevail simply because she thought she should. Believe me, I would love for someone else to rule, but it can't be you, you're just... The worst. Hela's sense of superiority kept her from winning anyone to her cause, with even her right-hand lieutenant abandoning ship when he couldn't stomach any more of her actions. She could have relied on her legitimate claim to the throne to win over the Asgardians, but instead of working with her brothers, she blasted them into oblivion without even checking to make sure they were gone for good, leaving herself wide open for them to team up against her. If she had taken the time to actually interact with the people of Asgard instead of terrorizing them, or if she'd collaborated with her brothers instead of opposing them, it may have led to an Asgard that all three of Odin's children could have lived in together, instead of one that had to be raised into nothing. Carol Danvers faces a variety of opponents in Captain Marvel, but jan Rog is by far the most insidious. He spends most of the film pretending to be her mentor and ally, but even when he's being set up as Carol's friend, there are hints of darkness lying beneath his friendly surface. Multiple times, he attempts to diminish her power under the guise of training her, accusing her of being too emotional. He pushes her to hold back rather than develop her strength and discourages her from exploring the limits of her powers. He claims this is for her own good, to teach her control, but it's really designed to keep her weak so that he can hold the power in the relationship. Gradually, as Carol uncovers the truth of who she is, she begins to realize that jan Rog's training was never meant to help her. Instead, he was giving her a pair of metaphorical handcuffs, holding her back so that the Kree can use her for their own purposes. Carol stepping into her own power feels like a threat to jan Rog, who wishes to keep her small so that he can feel big, important, and powerful. He even goes so far as trying to win her over with the approval he's been holding back once she realizes the truth. Strip away the superpowers, and it's a story all too familiar for many women who've been abused by insecure men. Jan Rog's weakness doesn't have anything to do with his physical capabilities, but everything to do with how threatened he feels by a strong woman. It's an attitude that leads him to getting blasted into a rock because once Carol figures out what he's doing, she has no tolerance for it anymore. There isn't a single Marvel villain who doesn't have some degree of hubris in their character, but no one displays this trait more than Thanos, whose plan to eliminate half of all life in the universe culminates in Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. Thanos is convinced that what he's doing isn't just right, but necessary, and that it's up to him to set things on a path that only he's allowed to determine no matter the cost. Granted, Thanos is incredibly powerful, and he actually does succeed despite his arrogance. But in viewing himself and his plan as inevitable, Thanos doesn't ever consider that there may be value in individual lives, teamwork, and self-sacrifice. He views the Avengers as pests to be swatted down rather than serious threats, and it never occurs to him that someone could be willing to sacrifice everything to preserve the lives Thanos wants to take. The Avengers fight their battle knowing the odds are against them, which makes them willing to do whatever they have to in order to earn their victory. They're willing to sacrifice themselves, while Thanos is only willing to sacrifice others. The Mad Titan never even considers that he might lose, which cracks open the door for exactly that to happen. 
For the first act of Spider-Man Far From Home, Quentin Beck seems like a pretty good guy. He's funny, he's charming, and he seems like exactly the sort of smart and nurturing mentor figure Peter Parker is looking for. Unfortunately, he's also a con man, nursing a serious grudge against his former employer, Tony Stark, and he's decided that the whole world has to pay for the wrong that was done to him. To be fair, Tony Stark was probably a pretty terrible boss to work for, and absolutely underestimated the technology Beck and his crew used throughout the film. Beck has every right to be mad, but the lengths he goes to in drawing together a group of similarly wronged ex-employees and hatching a plan to destroy entire cities in order to usurp Tony's legacy? That goes a little beyond leaving him a bad review on Glassdoor. This bitterness pushes Mysterio to keep going way past the time when he should have stopped. It leads him to keep attacking Peter with his drones even after they start malfunctioning, which ultimately leads to his death. 